Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back for day three of our discussion on the RA Enhancements Draft Final Proposal and Six Revised Draft Proposal. My name is Isabella Nicosia, representing ISO Stakeholder Affairs, and I'll be facilitating the web conference today. I'm also joined on the line by our three presenters for today, Milos Bozanek, Gabe Murtaugh, and Bridget Sparks, all from Infrastructure and Regulatory Policy. Uh, I'm also joined on the line by a number of other uh, subject matter experts from the ISO who are on the line um, and available to answer questions throughout today's call. We did shuffle some things around for today's agenda, so we did post an updated presentation to the initiative webpage. Um, so if you have not yet picked that up, um, then it's out there, so you can you can follow along. Um, and then. Today's call is being recorded. The recording is for informational and convenience purposes only, and any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. We will be taking questions throughout the call today, and you can enter the question queue at any time by pressing pound two on your telephone keypad. And just a reminder for everyone to please introduce themselves before asking your question. So the agenda for today's call, um, we're gonna start off with some continued discussion from yesterday on RA imports, and then we'll move into operationalizing storage and then backstop capacity procurement. And uh, you probably noticed that we will not get to the minimum system RA requirements or must offer obligation topics today. So we have scheduled an additional call for next Friday. Um, it'll be from 10 to noon, and we'll have a notice going out um, confirming that probably tomorrow. Um, so during that call, we will get to the minimum system RA requirement, must offer obligation, and then depending on how much we get through of backstop capacity procurement today, um, we may also incorporate some of that into the discussion next Friday. So with that, I will hand it over to Milos, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Isabella, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. We're going to continue the discussion from yesterday. If we can move Isabella to slide eight, just want to do a brief recap of quickly of what we covered yesterday, and then we'll uh, jump into where we left off uh, towards the end of the meeting. So slide eight here of the presentation provides an overview of the proposal. Yesterday, uh, we covered a number of these elements. We covered the source specification requirement where uh, RA imports uh, will need to identify the source generation and the source balancing authority area that's supporting the RA imports. And this source specification uh, will ensure that our RA imports are backed by real physical capacity, not paper capacity. Uh, we also discussed the attestation uh, requirement, which is intended to ensure that RA imports are committed solely to the load serving entity to which the capacity was sold and consequently to the CAISO. And this is intended to help ensure that the capacity is made available to the CAISO, especially during challenging system conditions when there are competing needs for capacity across the West. Uh, we started discussion on the third element, the transmission delivery requirements for uh, RA imports, which uh, we're going to wrap up today. This element is intended to ensure that uh, RA imports are deliverable to the CAISO for the duration of the showing uh, on high priority transmission that is less susceptible to curtailment risk. And really these three elements are intended to work together in unison and future-proof the RA program to ensure reliable and dependable RA imports in an increasingly capacity-constrained Western interconnection. Um, we do recognize that these requirements are new and they may have an impact on potential liquidity since uh, these requirements are not in the tariff today. But we think that uh, the implementation of these requirements for RA imports uh, will ensure that RA imports are a quality that provides us the ability to rely on them and depend on their strain system conditions across the West. So with, with that, background, let's jump into where we left off yesterday on the third element, the transmission delivery requirement. If we can go to slide 21, I'm going to jump around a couple of these slides. This is going to focus on a few key slides since we walked through this, uh, most of this yesterday, but just to remind everybody, um, the third element of the proposal is that uh, the RA imports will need to be delivered on high priority transmission to the CAISO. Uh, on the last transmission leg, the CAISO, the last line of interest, uh, the requirement will be that RA imports must be delivered on firm transmission, which is a 7F uh, reservation priority. This is the last, uh, this is the highest 
priority of transmission service and the last to be curtailed to the extent that transmission service needs to be curtailed. And then on all of the other intervening transmission legs, uh, the transmission service needed to support those deliveries will be on transmission that is no lower than monthly non-firm point-to-point transmission service. So that means in those intervening transmission legs, those RA imports can be delivered on monthly non-firm, which is the highest, which is a 5 and M curtailment priority, which is the highest of all of the non-firm priorities. Uh, it's the last of the non-firm transmission service to be curtailed. And uh, it could also be supported by conditional firm service uh, to the extent those transmission providers offer it, because some transmission providers may not offer this service. And uh, it could also be delivered on firm service, which is uh, ideally what we would want. The reason that we're requiring firm transmission service on the last transmission, like the KISO, is that in our experience, and focusing particularly on, uh, for example, on the Cobb and Knob interties, uh, during summer months, flows tend to be very close, uh, if not exceeding the uh, limits of those paths. So it's important that on those last lines of interest, um, RA imports be delivered on the highest priority transmission service because that is the last type of transmission service to be curtailed. Uh, that ensures, gives us the highest possible assurance that these RA imports are going to be delivered um, to the extent that there's a curtailment on those last paths. On the intervening transmission legs, we're a little bit providing a little bit more flexibility by allowing transmission service as low as monthly non-firm uh, because generally across the networks, there are multiple ways of getting across those networks to, to different points. And uh, because there are so many ways of getting there, there's not necessarily uh, as much concern uh, or there's the paths and the flow gates are not as constrained as some of the uh, interties. So we're allowing a little bit more flexibility with the delivery of monthly non-firm uh, or conditional firm service. But ideally, those deliveries would also be uh, supported by firm service. And as we covered a couple of days ago during the UCAP presentation, uh, there are UCAP impacts uh, depending on the type of transmission service that uh, the RA import is delivered on. To the extent the import is delivered on monthly non-firm or conditional firm service uh, across those intervening legs, and there's a curtailment of that transmission service, uh, that curtailment will be treated as an outage and considered for UCAP purposes. Uh, but to the extent that it's delivered on firm service, uh, if there's a curtailment of firm transmission, uh, there will be no impact on UCAP. And again, the intent here is to incentivize uh, deliveries on firm service uh, across from source to sink. So let's go to slide 31. Okay. So. Yesterday, we, we went over this. I went over a number of items here a bit quickly, but I wanted to just focus on, on an aspect here that's new in this presentation that's not necessarily in the draft final proposal, but we've had a chance to think about it and introduce it here. Um, it's RA import tagging requirements. Just a little bit of background first that uh, this year, in, I, I believe, was introduced on January 1st with the implementation of the Intertai Settlement Deviation Initiative, where we've introduced a T-minus 40 minutes uh, tagging deadline for submission of e-tags for imports uh, with the transmission profile equal to the economic bid or self-schedule. This was introduced again through that initiative, and then by T-minus 20, uh, parties can make uh, any revisions to the energy profile of the tag. Um, in the draft final proposal, we didn't necessarily introduce or propose a tagging deadline, but we're after having discussed it a little bit, we're introducing it here for stakeholder feedback. So let's go to the next slide and explain what this fanhead tagging deadline is. Okay, so uh, we're proposing a day ahead tagging deadline for RA imports, um, where essentially that deadline is by 3 p.m. on the day ahead, where you would need to submit, RA imports would need to submit a uh, e-tag with a transmission profile that would identify for us on the type, the type of transmission service that the RA imports are going to be delivered on. And then subsequent tagging deadlines will remain the ones that we covered, the T minus 40 and T minus 20, for any needed uh, adjustments. But the idea is that uh, the day ahead tagging deadline, again, would provide us that operational visibility 
of the type of transmission service that RA imports are going to be delivered on, and it also supports uh, day ahead planning for both the balancing authority area and uh, RC West. And so we're certainly, since we're introducing it here, we'd certainly appreciate your feedback, your thoughts on a day ahead tagging requirement for RA imports, uh, if there are any questions or, or challenges uh, that you foresee with this uh, introduction. We have two questions in the queue. Uh, well, let, let, uh, let me, we'll pause for questions in a bit, but uh, let me just get through the transmission section and then we'll pause for, for, for questions. So let's go to slide 33. Let's go to the next slide. So we went through this a bit quickly yesterday as well. Just wanted to highlight it again. Um, stakeholders expressed some concerns uh, in the last round of comments, uh, especially to the uh, workshops that we had in September, that uh, across the enterprise, there could be potential exercise of transmission market power due to the perception that only two or three entities hold the vast majority of the firm transmission rights on those paths. And the concern was that those entities, to the extent the ISO were going to proceed with a firm transmission requirement for RA imports, the concern was that those entities could potentially seek uh, uh, high prices for resale of transmission to support RA imports. And so some of these stakeholders uh, suggested that the CAISO should uh, allow for deliveries of RA imports across the enterprise on non-firm transmission. So let's go to the next slide. I wanted to just address those comments. Um, you know, we work with the different transmission providers that sell service uh, under their oaths across the COB and NOB enterprise to see just how many entities hold those rights, firm yearly rights. Uh, that means one year or longer in duration. And Across the Cobb entity, there are currently 21 different entities holding uh, yearly long-term rights across that entity, and then nine different entities holding those rights across the Knob entity. Um, and this is a mix of both marketers and LSEs that are holding those rights. And so, since there are 21 and nine different entities on, on across these entities holding those rights, we believe that uh, you know this is a robust number of entities who could be potential uh, parties for the resale of transmission service to the extent that um, an entity does not already hold those transmission rights, to firm transmission rights to support RA imports. If we can just briefly go on slide 35. So this is just a representation of, on the knob entity of the different holders and, and looking at August and December timeframes because some entities hold seasonal rights. Um, and as you can see there, there's a significant number of marketers that hold uh, rights as well as LSEs. Um, and some of these marketers, if not the majority, are already entities who currently and, and have historically supported RA imports to the CAISO. They already hold long-term firm rights uh, across the intertie. Uh, we do recognize that these parties, uh, both the LSEs and marketers, uh, utilize those rights today for their business needs or for serving loads to the extent they are LSE but there may be opportunities potentially for contracting with them for resale of firm transmission rights to the extent that, again, the party does not currently hold those rights, especially the LSCs. There may be periods of year where they're not using those rights and they may be willing to, to resell them. But there are 21 entities, like I said, that, that currently hold those rights. And then the next slide just uh, is the same representation, uh, but across the knob intertie showing the, the different entities that hold uh, long-term firm rights on those paths. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, briefly just wanted to address, I think this is where we left off yesterday, uh, but addressing some of those concerns regarding the exercise of transmission market power. Um, you know, I think we noted in previous presentation that this is something to the extent that there is exercise of transmission market power. This is something that's raised under the different tariffs of the transmission providers who are selling those rights and potentially raised with FERC. Um, but we will note that you know, firm transmission rights across the entity have historically been valuable and have supported a number of different uses um, without, you know, to my knowledge at least, uh, uh, being uh, any assertions of exercise of transmission market power. And it may be premature to assert that at this point um, until uh, the policy essentially comes into play and it, it materializes. But Ultimately, the recourses with the transmission providers under their oaths and with FERC. Um, and addressing the 
comment that non-firm transmission rights should uh, be able to support RA imports across the intertie. You know, from our perspective, uh, non-firm transmission rights, they're the lowest priority, uh, especially hourly non-firm, low priority transmission service that um, is the first to be curtailed. And as we've shown, I think, in um, one of the graphs and in the, in the draft final proposal uh, write-up, uh, on the COB and non intertie, particularly in the summer, uh, season, flows tend to reach the limit or be close to the limit, you know, which is an indication of a high risk of curtailment. And, and uh, low priority non-firm transmission service is the first to be curtailed. And so the firm requirement uh, for transmission service on those paths is necessary because it provides that added certainty that uh, it is the last type of transmission that is curtailed and provides that certainty that as much as possible that that RA import is going to be delivered uh, across that path. Uh, we'll also note that uh, you know, long-term firm transmission service or request for transmission service is what drives uh, expansion of the transmission system uh, and not request for non-firm service. So I think it's important to send the signals to the transmission providers uh, by requesting and by seeing, showing the demand for long-term firm transmission service, uh, that provides the incentives and the revenue and, and duration of transmission service to support upgrades, whereas if we were to allow non-firm transmission service, I think you know, there would be no incentive to, to expand the transmission system, uh, especially the intertides. So let's go to the next slide. I think this is the last slide of this section, and then we'll pause for questions. Uh, to talk a little bit about implementation of this transmission delivery requirement. Um, if you recall, when we talked about the attestation requirement, uh, transmission arrangements supporting RA imports have to be in place by the time of submission of the monthly uh, RA supply plan. So those transmission arrangements uh, should already be in place uh, at T minus 45 when you're submitting that uh, supply plan. And then we're going to be monitoring uh, RA imports deliveries uh, by looking at the E tags on which those are delivered on. And we're going to be flagging for ourselves internally any deliveries of RA imports that are on transmission service that is on lower priority than what we have specified in the tariff, uh, which is we will flag any RA imports that are delivered on uh, lower transmission priority than firm transmission 7F on that last transmission like the CAISO and we'll flag also any uh, transmission deliveries, any RA import deliveries on the intervening systems that are on transmission service that's lower than monthly non-firm transmission 5 and M priority. Um, the idea is that, you know, through this monitoring, to the extent that we do discover that anybody is delivering RA imports on lower priority transmission than required under the tariff, that is something that we're going to investigate and, and refer potentially to DMM for investigation as it would be a, uh, tariff violation. So we will be actively uh, monitoring these tags. I think that's the last section, last slide of the transmission delivery section. So let's, let's pause here for any questions on the transmission requirement. Call your lines unmuted, please go ahead. Hi, this is Doug Bocciniani from Flynn Resource Consultants on behalf of the CCA. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, re regarding the, the data that you showed about the, the firms that had the long-term rights on the southern intertie, I, I guess I come to a different conclusion. I mean, you talk about 21 parties have, have those rights between the, the two, um, the AC and the DC. But the rights are really concentrated. I mean, there's only two parties on the DC and three that control about half of all the transmission import capability. Um, so I, I think it's a little bit, I, mean, I don't know, it just makes me concerned that if, if California is dependent on imports from the Northwest to be able to meet the resource adequacy requirements, particularly increases um, in the requirements over the net low peak hours that are being proposed on an interim basis. 
Um, and if those were to continue once these farm transmission requirements are in place, um, I think it, there's the potential for those parties that control those rights to be in a you know, much different position than they are in today. I mean, what happens now is any you know, we, California parties can contract with uh, you know, the holders of generation capacity and then if they can't reach an agreement uh, to get the firm transmission, the, the transmission has to be released in real time. And Kaiser's requirements would take that away. And the, the open access tariff doesn't have any other provision other than this required release to mitigate the potential for people to exercise market power. And so I think you, you'd be putting uh, parties in a kind of an awkward position, right? There, we'd be filing a complaint for now for some pr prospective harm that might be made to us because of something Kaiso did. You know, is it a deficiency of the oath, or is it the deficiency of the Kaiso tariff that's causing this problem? Um, I mean, so that, that's a real concern. The, the the other thing is in terms of like sending the signal for upgrades. I mean, these are in, this is going to be an interregional transmission project that would deal with any um, need to upgrade the the PACI or the DC, and you know that's not you know just the fact that people are making transmission requests isn't what's going to drive that. I mean, Kaiser facilities would also need to be upgraded. And it isn't clear that this is any real, that there's actually a shortage of physical transmission capability. It's, you know, are, are, is there an ability to contract with parties for the rights? No, I appreciate that perspective. Maybe let's, let's take it one point at a time. Um, Bridget, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the HHI numbers? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. This is Bridget Spark. So um, we looked at um, – so if we can go back to the, um, the bar charts real quick. Um, so I did calculate um, HHI indexes for each of the inner ties, um, which is a measure used to evaluate market concentration. And so – Kind of the standard um, metric is if the HHI is under 1,500, it's a competitive market. Um, and so for Cobb, um, the HHI is under 1,500. Um, on NAB, there's a smaller number of marketers, so um, the HHI index is higher, um, definitely more concentrated on that inner tie, but. If we think of the market as Cobb and Knob combined, um, the HHI is under 1,600. So while there is a slight um, market concentration, um, it's nowhere near um, sort of a monopolistic control. Um, and so I think, you know, while some of these look large, um, you know, if you look at the HHI, it's not as bad as it may appear. Um, and so just wanted to kind of put that um, information out there for folks to consider. Um, and whether or not these, these parties are willing to, um, you know, procure, but I will say the marketers are folks that you, that we know already are selling RE imports. And so, um, you know, I don't think this requirement would prevent them from um, continuing to um, contract with entities. So um, just to kind of take a step back, the HHI index is basically you um, – it's an index of market concentration as percent of market share. So um, – for getting off the top of my head what the exact um, – but basically you calculate the market share in each whatever you consider a market, um, 
And anyway, so it's, it's a common metric. Um, and so that's, you know, something folks to consider. Um, and so I'll, I'll hand it back to Milos to respond to um, some of your other points. Can, can I just ask a, a follow-up question? Have you looked at this in, from the perspective of the pivotal supplier test and competitive path assessment? If, if you were factoring in transmission as the commodity? Um, no, we haven't done a pivotal supplier test um, in the way that you're describing. So our kind of first look at this was just the HHI index to kind of see if there was, um, to kind of see if this at first blush was a competitive or non-competitive market. Yeah. Um, and based on that metric, it is. So, um, but we haven't done um, the kind of analysis that you're talking about. And, and I just, one last point is that, you know, mm -hmm. Because of the mitigation measure that exists today, I think there is, you know, there, there's at least a check in place, but what you're proposing mm -hmm. would take away that check. That's that's the concern. Anyway, sorry. I, it, mm -hmm. Sure. And, and, and maybe can you, what's that check? that you're seeing? Is it non-firm transmission? The, the transmission has to be released in real time at, at cost-based rates. Well, I think I think the transmission is released to the extent that it's not scheduled against, uh, right? But, but ultimately, the holder of those transmission rights who's paying for those transmission rights, you know, they, have, they have the ability to schedule all the way up to sure. real time uh, on those rights. So, you know, the release occurs only to the extent those uh, rights are not scheduled, I guess, I think by 10 p.m. Uh, of the day prior, you know. Uh, and then to yeah, the extent but, that... But the Southern Intertie is it's sort of unique, right? It's like the facilities north of California are, you know, they're the same path as the facilities south of California. So if, if energy has been scheduled in on those facilities, it, it's coming in. We're going to get it. So. So uh, this is John Gooden. I guess I'm a little confused because I hear this concern expressed, and yet I also hear um, that there's no shortage. Um, and so I'm trying to sort of understand why the challenge here and why the pushback if there really isn't a shortage capacity. Because I would think that if I were a supplier and a transmission provider and I had excess capacity, why would I wait to the last minute to sell that at some tariff-based rate? Why wouldn't I want to try to enter into uh, a longer-term agreement uh, with a party and, you know, secure those revenues up front and for a, a, a longer duration? I just – I'm confused by the pushback, particularly if there is excess capacity, then those providers will want to get rid of that capacity. No, I guess when I think we've got to separate two pieces. There's the generation capacity and the transmission capacity, and I'm only we're in an environment. Yeah, when I'm talking, I'm only so we're on the generation side, which I think is super important. You know, the pool of potential suppliers is, you know, greater if you if they don't have to have had secured the transmission up front. So but you can't, but at the, sorry, sorry, Doug. Go ahead. Um, sorry. At the end of the day, no, sir. At the end of the day, you have to match the megawatts from the generators and suppliers with the transmission service. It requires both, um, not one or the other. And so it doesn't matter how much generation capacity you have independently or how much transmission capacity we have independently. It's those two linked and working together. And so, um, again, my focus has been on transmission service and the need to firm that up up front. And again, I may be mistaken, but I thought your point was is that there was plenty of transmission capacity. And so, um, you know, what's the concern? And I say just the opposite. Yeah, of course, if there's plenty, then what is the concern? 
No, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, that there's a limited amount of energy that's available to to come into California. And yes, it, there's many hours where the inner ties are fully subscribed. But, you know, those are the hours when California is getting all the energy that can be brought in. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's coming from an RA resource or a non-RA resource. The energy is coming in. And, you know, if there has to be a cut to the to the southern inner tie, that's the same cut that the CAISO on the CAISO side is being made. So it sort of like doesn't matter whether you have firm rights or non-firm rights. The amount of power flowing into the state is is unaffected by that. It will be what it is. So, well, Doug, I you know, I, mean, I get this. I get the idea about trying to send a long-term signal, and I think you know there's validity yeah. in in exploring that. But it, it, this particular signal is not going to be what gets the inner ties upgraded. There's just, it's going to be a variety um, of things: IRPs and the interregional transmission planning process, the CAISO's transmission planning process. I agree, but if we don't get in the queue, then that's one key important element that goes missing that helps drive all those other discussions. So we're probably not ever, you know, we're probably not going to agree on this point. Uh, it's more sort of almost a philosophical difference. This is the path that we think is prudent and reasonable and just going forward. Um, my one point, Doug, is that, yes, I agree that whatever capacity um, is available and transferable to California is what it is. But that doesn't mean that it's dedicated to California. There's certainly ability to wheel through to the southwest. So just because it can get here uh, doesn't mean it's RA and dedicated to California. It could just sail right on through the ISO. So I hear your point, but I don't agree that that uh, you know makes it okay. Yeah, and I, I guess I just would respond to that. You know. To the extent California continues to be willing to sell its transmission on an hourly basis, only in the hours when it's really needed, you know, we're putting ourselves in a really precarious position. So we need to be addressing that as well. Okay, thanks, Doug. Thank you. Okay, operator, next question, please. Call your lines unmuted, please go ahead. Hi, Milos and John, it's Jeff Spires from PowerX here. Um, good afternoon, I, I, was, I was going to make a, a comment about the, the day ahead e-tags, but you know, just in light of the conversation with Doug, I, I, I wanna make a couple of comments on that discussion because it seems like you know, we get back into this same debate um, with the same misunderstandings of the oat and the same general misinformation and, and discussion getting portrayed that, that's just wrong on a number of fronts. And I think, John, I absolutely agree with what you just said to kind of tackle things in reverse order. One of the, the, the discussion points here is around whether it's important from a delivery, a reliability of delivery perspective to have firm transmission on the southern inner thigh. and some of the comments seem to suggest that, well, it doesn't matter because it's all coming to the CAISO anyway, and that is just not true. That is a mistake to assume that. The Southern Intertai rights can be used to deliver to the CAISO, but also to bank, to LA, to use LA's share of the DC to get to the Southwest, and to wheel through the CAISO, as John, you pointed out, to get to the Southwest on the CAISO transmission system. And so it really comes down to a question of, does the CAISO want to ensure that during these periods, when the transmission system is highly utilized and the need to ensure supply is deliverable is most important, do you want to have the highest priority for your RA supply or do you want to be subordinate to other uses, including deliveries to other locations that can bump supply going to the CAISO? So the idea that this isn't an important issue and that firm rights don't provide a benefit and that, and that the CAISO should um, not pursue it on that basis is just completely wrong. The second point that I just want to make is 
There continues to be a misunderstanding about the OAT and the availability of this transmission. I think all of this information that the CAISO has compiled is really helpful, and I also think it's been really good to have CAISO staff reaching out to Bonneville and others and trying to get firsthand the real story about what goes on out there rather than just focusing on what stakeholders have to say. But that being said, I think I just want to clarify from our perspective a couple of pretty important points here. One is all of these rights are secured through a competitive process, through the OAT framework that's been approved by FERC, and that is a competitive process. These rights are subject to competition on an ongoing basis. There are repeatedly opportunities for new entities to request service and compete as the rights that are currently held expire and come up for renewal, and we are seeing that occur. Even as the CAISO has started to contemplate having firm transmission requirements, we see entities that have made the claims that it's not available take the steps that they need to take, including competing, including requesting in the queue for long-term service, and taking the steps that they need to take to try to get the service. So it really comes down to do you want to make the investment in the service or not. And the other thing I just want to point out is in addition to competing at the time of renewals, there's the opportunity to enter the secondary market. The transmission service providers themselves have the opportunity to sell more. And so there are multiple ways. There are redirect opportunities. There's multiple ways to get the service if the entity is willing to make that investment. The last thing I'd point out on this, just I think it's important to recognize when we're looking at these percentages, is the Southern Intertie capability to get to Cobb and Knob is nearly 8,000 megawatts. It's nearly double the import capability at Cobb and Knob to receive RA. So, you know, I think that's really an important point when we're sort of contrasting the different percentages. It's not only that there's, you know, 21 different entities or whatever it is that hold the rights, but the total amount of these rights far exceeds what's available from an import capability perspective on the other side of the Intertie. And, you know, so I think when we're talking about some of these concerns, looking at the MIC allocation and trying to understand, well, how is that allocated in a way that ensures that there's competition for the import capability space on the CAISO side of the Intertie? I mean, I think that that is an area that would probably justify further exploration because on the OAT side, like I say, multiple ways to get it, many different rights holders, and far more capability than there is on the CAISO side. So I just, you know, I know we've had this conversation before and we've made many of these same points in our written comments, but I think it bears repeating at this point. The other thing I just wanted to quickly touch on was the day ahead ETAGs. That is something we have been advocating for for quite some time, and so we do appreciate you putting that in the presentation for consideration. I just wanted to add a couple of things in terms of why we think that this is really something that's important. Really, when you take a step back, we're talking about contracts that are being arranged for on a forward basis, and they might be a year ahead or a month ahead, but they're being initiated prior to the operating day, obviously. And really, the day ahead ETAG is the first time that the CAISO has an opportunity in that operating horizon to validate that that supply is actually being scheduled. And, you know, I think you have that on the slide, but one of the nuances I just wanted to help clarify on that is there's actually two benefits to that. One is it gives the CAISO itself the opportunity to do its validation, including reviewing whether the transmission is of the right priority, et cetera. But it also gives the external entities the opportunity to approve that tag and validate it, whether it's the transmission service providers or the source VA, et cetera. Those entities also then can validate that tag, and that gives further 
confidence to the CAISO that, yes, this supply is actually being made available and there are no operational issues uh, that you need to be aware of. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, this really is something that is, would allow the CAISO to get, um, to, to develop an approach that's more consistent with the rest of the West. Because for the rest of the West, forward transactions as well as day ahead transactions are tagged on a day ahead basis. Those, you know, WSPP, Schedule C transactions, et cetera, whether they're executed on a forward basis or day ahead, have the requirement to be tagged day ahead. And so this is really a, a, a way to, to have the CAISO's practices align with that. And ultimately, um, I think it's something that's critical if you're contemplating uh, an EDAM, for example, because there aren't going to be other entities that are comfortable with um, having one BA accepting e-tags 20 minutes before delivery or 40 minutes before delivery. There's going to be a need to make sure that everybody can see how are these transactions arranged, which resources are scheduled, what is the transmission. That's going to be really important in the context of a regional market. And so I think this is a really important step, and uh, I just wanted to add some of that additional um, detail because I, I do think it's something that's important and, and definitely needs to be pursued, and we appreciate seeing it here. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Operator, how many more questions do we have in queue? I'm trying to be mindful of the time. We have two more on the line. Okay. Would it be possible to – let's defer those two questions until we get through the next two sections, and then let's see – uh, how many more questions? I want to make sure that I do touch on everything and, and we don't delay this topic and, and merge others into another day. So uh, let's defer those for now and then we'll come back to them at the end of these next two sections. Okay, so let's go then uh, to the must offer obligation um, uh, overview here. So currently, RA imports are subject uh, only to a day ahead must offer obligation. And if there's no award in day ahead, there's no obligation to bid in uh, in real time. Um, now, I will note, and we'll get into, that, into this on the next slide, but if they're dynamically scheduled or pseudotied resources, um, those do have uh, must offer obligations more consistent with internal resources. So they have both a day ahead and a real time obligation. Uh, but to the extent that they're not dynamic and they're not pseudotied, then they have this uh, obligation that I noted here. So we're proposing extending this must-offer obligation then for those resources that currently don't have it that are import resources, uh, extending that into the real-time market on an interim basis. So they would have to bid in that full capacity in real time, regardless of whether they've been awarded in day ahead and bid insertion rules would apply. Uh, now, this interim basis for, uh, for uh, real-time must-offer obligation uh, is interim because of some of the work that's being done in the Day Ahead Market Enhancements Initiative, and that initiative will further develop and dictate on what happens to the uh, real-time must-offer obligation um, after the same initiative. But there's some consideration of a transition period to the implementation of that DAME initiative, uh, and this interim real-time must-offer obligation would apply all the way through that transition period. Uh, that's ultimately identified in, in the DAME initiative. So let's go to the next slide, just provides a quick little chart identifying what the must-off obligations are. So as I mentioned, for this interim period um, that we're talking about, pseudotai and dynamically scheduled resources in the day ahead market, they have an obligation to bid in the full RA capacity, this is the status quo, as well as uh, in the real-time market or interim basis, this um, status quo essentially applies as well if they're short uh, and medium start unit, they bid in their full RA capacity, but all other units, uh, to the extent, again, they're dynamically scheduled or pseudotyped, bid in that full RA capacity for any hour in which they have a day ahead award. So think of long start units. Now, the, the nuance here, the difference is that for non-dynamic resource-specific RA imports, this is this new read of resources that, you know, you can equate to uh, non-resource-specific resource treatment today. Uh, but uh, these would have a, um, in the day ahead market, a status quo bid in the full RA capacity for all hours. There's a 24 by 7 must offer obligation for RA imports. And then in the real time market, 
they would also have to bid in that uh, full RA capacity, regardless of whether they have been awarded in their head or not, and bid insertion rules would continue to apply. Can everybody hear me okay? Welcome to Verizon Wireless. The wireless customer you called is not available at this time. Please try your call again later. We, we, we could hear you and that. Eight um, dash seven. Okay. I think this will pass. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. The wireless company Michelle. you called is not available at this time. Please try your call again later. And now yeah, I'm trying to one, identify six, what eight line that is Verizon seven. and we're AT and T, so it has to be somebody on the speaker line. One moment, please. Okay, they muted themselves. Okay, thanks. Okay, go ahead, Nilesh. Okay, you can go ahead. I hope that wasn't Nilesh. Nilesh, is your line muted? Nilesh, we can't hear you. He's not muted, so operator. Okay, I think I've been unmuted now. There we go. Can you hear me okay? There we go. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so as I was saying in, in this slide, page 41, regarding non-dynamic resource-specific RA imports, uh, there will be a uh, must-offer obligation both in the day ahead in real time to bid up to the full RA capacity, and in real time, uh, that bid is for the full RA capacity, regardless of whether there was an award in day ahead, uh, and bid insertion rules will continue to apply. Now, there were some comments in the last set of stakeholder comments regarding pseudo-time dynamically scheduled resources where stakeholders wanted to make sure that, uh, to the extent that these are a particular technology type resources that have a unique must-offer obligation tied to that technology type, that pseudo-time dynamically scheduled resources uh, would be treated in the same way as internal resources of that same technology type. And uh, that is, will continue to be the case. If you're pseudo tied or dynamically scheduled wind or solar resource, uh, you will continue to have the same must offer obligation that, that's tied to solar and wind resources or BERS um, uh, that are internal, same as internal resources. And much more of the, the overall must offer obligation uh, framework will be discussed, uh, I think, next week uh, when uh, when Lauren goes over this. So let's go uh, to the next slide. One more. So just wanted to touch on some uh, additional miscellaneous items uh, that uh, were raised in stakeholder comments, uh, particularly regarding uh, RA import bidding practices. A number of stakeholders expressed concern that RA imports uh, currently have the ability to submit high bids and day ahead uh, as a way of awarding, uh, avoiding an award and then selling that, making that energy available elsewhere. And uh, I think back uh, a couple of years ago, DMAP had shared some data looking at August of 2018 where the data indicated that uh, about 13.8% of the time across that month non-resource-specific RA import uh, resources uh, bids were an average of 500 megawatts or more, fairly high amount. So we've looked into the data for the same month, August of 2019 and August of 2020, looking at the bidding patterns of non-resource-specific RA imports, and the data indicates a significant drop in bids or average bids about $500 a megawatt hour. In 2019, that decreased to 2.8%, and in uh, uh, August of 2020, that decreased to 2%. And I anticipate that, you know, this decrease was largely driven by the attention that's been put on this topic uh, in light of the data that DMM shared, uh, the attention that's been placed both by the CAISO and I think in the CPC proceeding. Uh, so that's probably been a contributing factor if we can go into the next, just briefly, I'll go over the graphics and then we'll wrap this up and pause for questions. But this is the graphic for 2018. It's also in the in the 
right up in the draft final proposal. But if you can look and see the, on that chart, anything above that yellowish line, um, you know, those are bids of 500 or more, and then the red is uh, up to 995, and then the brown is, is uh, 995 to 1,000 dollars a megawatt hour. So you can see there, 13.8 percent in August of 2018 were bids above 500. If we go to the next slide, just briefly, looking at August of 2019. Uh, you know, those, that line all the way at the top, looking at, I think that bids of 500 or more, which is kind of brown color, has significantly decreased, and it's only 2.8% of, of the time that these average uh, hourly bids are above $500 a megawatt hour. And then the next slide looks at August of 2020, where that further decreases. That line is even smaller there, uh, down to 2%. Uh, on average uh, across the month where the bids are at $500 or, or more. If we go to the next slide, just briefly to touch on this. So we think that, you know, combined with this, you know, this decrease in, in these high bids, it doesn't mean necessarily that, that the high, that the, uh, that all of these bids are, are not intended to be high to avoid awards, but the instances have decrease significantly, and I think combined with some of the aspects of our proposal, uh, we're providing further incentives and protections uh, for the submission of competitive bids by, by RA imports. So first, we've introduced, an, at least on an interim basis, a real-time must-offer obligation. So now RA imports have to both uh, be available in day ahead, they have a must-offer obligation there, and they have to be available or remain available to real-time where they have to bid in there. Uh, full RA capacity. Uh, the second element is that the attestation requirement requires, if you recall, that uh, the capacity be committed only to the CAISO, effectively be committed to the LSC uh, that's contracted the capacity and consequently to the CAISO. And that, again, sets the incentive that if they haven't sold that same capacity elsewhere and it's dedicated and exclusively to, to the CAISO, that sets the incentive for them to bid it into the market since they cannot make it available elsewhere. The third component here, I think, is uh, that also the transmission requirement, uh, requiring high priority transmission service to be to deliver RA imports, especially since it has to be secured uh, at the time of by the time of submission of the RA supply plan. Again, in sense that uh, more competitive economic bidding of RA imports to recover those costs associated with that transmission. And then uh, finally, and probably a little bit to a lesser extent, but uh, sometime later this year, we're going to be implementing uh, uh, aspects of FERC Order 831, which increased the uh, energy bid cap to, I think, $2,000 a megawatt hour. But as part of that process, uh, we're going to be, um, uh, there's going to be price screening for RA import bids about $1,000 a megawatt hour, and those will be decreased uh, to as low as $1,000 uh, a megawatt hour to the extent that, um, you know, the price cannot be justified. But we'll be implementing this a little bit later this year, and this provides protections, not necessarily for bids that are up to 1000 but to the extent that anybody's bidding above 1000 uh, there will be price screening for RA import bids about $1,000. If we go to the next slide, yeah. and I'll just wrap up with, uh, this is the last slide, and then we'll pause for quick questions, but uh, a little bit about implementation. We're proposing a two-step implementation approach where in, uh, for RA year 2022, this will be a bridge year where parties and suppliers will be encouraged to meet some of these requirements, to, be, to meet these requirements. Uh, for RA imports, the source specification, the transmission delivery requirement, the attestation requirement. Um, we recognize that there may be a need to uh, develop some strategies to acquire transmission or to potentially uh, modify agreements to comport with the requirements. So the bridge year is intended really to be that year where parties get prepared and, and make the changes that are necessary to be able to comply these with these requirements. And then by RA year 2023 is when these requirements would become mandatory and, uh, you know, the source transmission and attestation requirements uh, will be mandatory and, and in order for RA imports to uh, be shown in supply plans. 
So I'll pause here. This ends this presentation. I'll pause here for questions and let's see how far we get in questions and then we may not be able to get to all of them in order to get to the next topics, but uh, we'll certainly make accommodations for answering them offline. So let's, operator, how many questions do we have? We have three questions in the queue at this moment. Okay, let's go to the next one. Call your lines unmuted, please go ahead. Hi, Milos, this is uh, Tony Braun. Um, uh, I was in the queue earlier, but it, now is it, uh, absolutely the perfect time to raise this. Okay. Um, and it, it's something that's um, that Jeff alluded to. Um, so it's all well and good to talk about taking care of and making proposals for north of the tie point, but the LSEs in your BA have to match it up with NIC. And if they can't get NIC on the, the paths, then they really can't access those markets. And as, um, there, currently there is no release obligation for those that are holding NIC and we're underutilizing it, it's fallow. So irrespective of how, whatever rules we put north of the inner tie, on the California side, the LSEs don't have this commercial barrier where they can't match up their MIC that they need to show to you in order to count to RA resource. So what, what thought was given to um, uh, including that here in the fix? Um, and we're just FYI, we're raising this in the 2021 discussion too because you guys have emphasized uh, that you think it increased RA imports are the way uh, a potential partial solution to some of the issues for 2021 when you filed at the PUC. And so I'd like to give some insight into your thinking on what we can do to match up the MIC rules here because I, it seems like we're only having a part of the equation addressed. Yeah, thanks, Tony, for that. Can you elaborate a little bit more on, on what's the barrier to matching up the MIC? Uh, are you talking about maybe multi-year allocations or? No, no, the, 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 uh, some load serving entities that are seeking to do RA imports with suppliers mm -hmm. outside the California BAA don't have the MIC to uh, match with that in order to count it, and they can't get it. And yet, as a BA, we're not even using a, a significant fraction of the MIC that's out there available. So there's a commercial stickiness somewhere in the in the rules that we created from a regulatory perspective, and we won't be able to um, fully utilize any proposals for you know, firming up RE imports unless we fix that element of it. I see. Yeah, so, uh, you, do. you know, I think we'll have to get back to you. I'll, I'll have to circle back with Catalan a little bit more. I know we did talk a little bit about this internally, but I want to understand about some, a little bit more about some of those limitations, because ultimately, you know, some, I think the LSEs are allocated ultimately, you know, make at particular points that they choose, and there's the ability to acquire more through bilateral arrangements, uh, but maybe I can oh, circle yeah. back. Maybe so, 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 and, and, and just to make and just to make sure that we don't go down a, a rabbit trail here, we are not talking about the technical studies that come up with the MIC amount and the total simultaneous import capability. We're talking about the MIC, it's there. The system can handle more imports but we're not coming close. If, if the resources are there, that's an open question. Um, uh, we're not, you know, we're not even coming close to getting to that number. And so what's stopping that from happening? I think we have a good idea of what's stopping, but somehow I think we need to figure out a way to um, uh, get that dialogue into these RA discussions. Yeah. Sorry, John. John Gooden. So, yeah, no problem. Appreciate that input because, yeah, absolutely valid. MIC has been a, a thorn in the side uh, for some time, and and there are challenges with it. I know that Catalan went through his, uh, I think we called it the MIC stabilization initiative here recently. Um, I was hoping Cat would be on and able to respond um, to some of this, but I think Doug raised this as well and others acknowledge that MIC is a sticky point. Um, and, you know, worth further discussion. Um, but in saying that, I would say that these policies still are important, um, not discounting the fact of your point, 
at all, Tony. So thanks, Tony. We'll we'll uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more here internally and, and see uh, where we can fit this uh, the best. Right, thank you. Let's make uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you. Operator, next question, please. Caller, go ahead. Hey, Milo, uh, Steve Greenlee, Brookfield. Um, I have what I hope is a quick process question, and my apologies if you or John or Carl covered this the past two days. Um, I'm just trying to get straight in my mind how uh, the RA enhancements, or at least you know the import RA rules process is going to work out. I think you're bringing this to the board in March. Correct me if that's I'm right. That's right. And is the intent to uh, file it for shortly thereafter? I mean, segment the pieces out in our enhancements, or are you going to wait till September when the last pieces uh, go before the board? Seven, seven Lauren, eight, maybe you can jump in and just give a quick overview on the schedule. Sure. Yeah, sure. So um, in order to have the RA import policy um, go in place in um, for RA compliance year 2022, we'll need to take it to the board in March um, and file um, prior to fall of 2021 um, in order to have that implemented. Um, for RA year 2022. Okay, and you're going to take it to FERC because 2022 is kind of a, whatever you want to call it, a trial year, right, or a test year. It's not going to be full implementation, right? Right, right. We're, okay. we're, you know, we'll, I believe these elements will be part of the spring release, any kind of technology upgrade so that we're ready for 2022. But ultimately, the implementation is 2023, the mandatory. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And then um, there's obviously elements in this instant proposal, such as, you know, she mentioned the tagging. I think the other day the elements of the auto station that are not in or, uh, well, I think they're not in and not necessarily different from what you guys filed at the PEC in December, just mm -hmm. if you can go back and talk about kind of like, are you intending to update the PUC approval? And can you talk a little bit about, I assume you're anticipating the, getting a CPUC ruling. Obviously, hopefully you'd like to see them adopt your proposal, but if they don't in June, are you still going to move ahead with a third filing? Um, you know, on a standalone basis, regardless of what the PUC did? I think you may have touched on this the other day, but I'm not sure. Yeah, Steve, this is John Gooden. We are planning to file this uh, set of packages on the RE imports at the end of this year. And again, the idea is to obviously coordinate and allow for 2022 to be that sort of test year. Um, again, we don't think um, looking at how the PUCs are a rules for imports versus our rules, that they're incompatible. I think the only part that would be incompatible is the non-resource specific and a definition around that, how we're making that um, more resource specific. But apart John, your that, phone is breaking up a little bit. Okay, thanks. Um, not sure why, but apart I think it's from that. Now. Okay, apart from that, Steve, I don't, I don't see these as incompatible. Um, again, it may be a bit of belt and suspenders, but between PUC rules and our rules, um, and we think that we could, that the PUC could relax some of its rules 
but um, we see these as minimum requirements. That's kind of how we've been uh, characterizing this. These will be minimum requirements that RA imports coming into our market will have to meet. And then the LRAs can either just straight adopt or add to uh, these minimum requirements. Okay. All right. I mean, that's helpful clarification of your perspective. It does seem a little complicated. I mean, I think I understand your point on, you know, obviously PUC today under the rules, they're providing for non resource specific. Um, you're, I guess, at a minimum level, turning the non resource specific into you know, specifying the source BAA. Um, but, and I right. also understand, I think your rationale or your point is if you got your, the entirety of your proposal in place, a lot of the current CPUC bidding requirements could be relaxed, um, but obviously they aren't um, right now. So anyway, yeah, I'm just trying to get straight in my head how kind of these parallel paths work out and, and what is likely to be in place. But at this point, uh, you know, I think I understand your position. These, and from the TISO's perspective, are kind of what you think are the necessary minimums so you are intending to move ahead and file these at FERC and establish them as minimums in the KISO tariff, obviously subject to LRA enhancements. For That's right. Of other okay. That's right. And, I, okay. and the PUC would have, yeah, thanks, Stephen. The PUC would have not only this year, but really next year to make the final formal decision because what we're talking about is this would be um, live in 2023. It would be enforced. So, yeah, I understand that. You know, it's there, still there's some exactly plan. how you're going to uh, uh, characterize that to FERC as far as filing this year and sort of implementing in 2022, but I guess that remains to be seen. So just going back, I think Lauren said, so file um, the, the import RA is going to move forward with a FERC filing prior to uh, kind of wrapping the whole thing up in September. Is that right? That would be our goal to get a FERC a decision, affirmative decision by the end of this year. Oh, no, excuse okay. me, about September timeframe, so we can, yeah, let me, sorry, okay. back up. By that September timeframe, um, and then try to implement here in the, in the fall. Okay. All right, that's helpful. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Operator, any more questions in the queue? Uh, yes, we do have one more question. All right. Call your lines unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, this is Steve again. I think perhaps I hit the button twice. <laughs> so. Encore. All right. Okay, caller, go oh. ahead. You're unmuted. Hi, very much. Um, I think that's on slide 41. I just had a quick question. I think it was 41. The one with the table of... Uh, you can just scroll back there. Yeah, that's it. So I was just wondering, why are the non-dynamic resource-specific RA imports fully subject to bidding full RA capacity regardless of a DA award, whereas the pseudo-tie ones have an exception, you know, for units that aren't short or medium start? Is that because all the non-dynamic stuff is short and medium start units, or is there something unique about them that they don't? Yeah. get any exception to that rule. Yeah, so with pseudo-time dynamically scheduled resources, these are resources that are modeled in our market. Uh, you know, we have full master file parameters associated with them, uh, so we know if they're short start, medium start units, and, and all of its characteristics. Uh, for non-dynamic resource-specific RA imports, you know, these are resources that are not necessarily modeled in our market and have master file parameters are similar in nature to non-resource specific resources today, except, you know, in the future, they're going to have to meet those, provide those additional requirements of source specificity, attestation, and transmission. 
but the main reason is that these are not modeled. We don't know the full parameters of the resources. Uh, to the extent that any non-dynamic resource-specific RA import wanted to, um, you know, be bound by some of these other uh, qualities and, and, you know, have a different must-offer obligation uh, commensurate with, with the qualities of that resource, they could be pseudo-titled dynamically scheduled. And, and at that point, you know, we would model them in our market and, and be aware of all of their characteristics. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, operator, any more questions? There are no more questions in the queue. Okay. Perfect. Well, then thank you, everybody. Um, just a reminder again, this is in the draft final proposal stage. So please, if you do have any questions as you're going through the slides or you're reviewing the, the draft final proposal, please do reach out to us prior to submitting comments. If you have any clarifying questions or don't understand something, we're certainly uh, open to discussing it and, and clarifying anything uh, that, that you may need uh, prior to the submission of comments. All right, I'll turn it over to Gabe now. Thank you. Thanks, Milos. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us after uh, three fairly long days. Uh, we do appreciate it. And I think um, Milos's sign off there is a good note on the operationalizing storage aspects of this proposal as well. We are in the draft final proposal stage here. And I know, um, you know, on the face of it, I don't think the proposal has changed very much but we have included some nuanced changes to how and when we want to apply um, these tools. So I think, you know, with those in mind, um, I, you know, I think they were in response to a lot of the stakeholder comments that we received from the last few drafts and from working with some of the um, storage community on these proposals. So I'm hoping that we're moving in a direction that can be, um, you know, a little bit more representative of um, a tool that, you know, maybe if the storage community doesn't love, maybe it's something that they can get behind for a few years while we develop a more permanent solution, um, a market-based solution to these kinds of issues. But um, from an ISO perspective, we do still see that these issues um, that we've been talking about around operationalizing storage will be present in the market, and we will need something um, in the relatively near term to address those concerns, and these tools that we're proposing here are sort of the first cut from the ISO on those tools. Um, but I'm sure as we develop um, and grow our uh, fleet further with additional storage resources, um, so too will these ideas about how we're going to manage the storage resources grow at that time. Okay, um, so we're on slide 50 for those of you who are following along, and uh, this is a slide that's largely review, um, but I will go through it uh, nevertheless. Um, storage resources and uh, the resource mix in the ISO are rapidly changing, and they're forecast to rapidly change over the next few years. As I'm sure everyone on this call is familiar, the California Public Utilities Commission has authorized the procurement of 3,300 megawatts of new um, resource adequacy capacity that's scheduled to come onto the market over the next three years. That authorization for new capacity is largely a response to uh, planned retirement of older steam resources on the system, which are also planned to retire within that three-year period. After those resources are retired, um, California ISO is also noting that there's a retirement scheduled for Diablo Canyon Nuclear Facility in 2024. Um, that facility is over 2,000 megawatts. You can imagine that, you know, if we're just on the cusp of, um, you know, having enough resources on our system, perhaps as evidenced over uh, last summer, then if we retire 2,000 megawatts of um, 24 by 7 capacity, we're going to need replacement capacity for that, um, that resource once it retires. Um, we anticipate that most, well, I, I think the first thing I should say is that most of the 3,300 megawatts of uh, capacity that we're seeing coming online in the next few years is storage resources. Um, and specifically, those are four-hour duration lithium-ion batteries that are storage resources. And most of the storage resources that are in the interconnection queue 
will be locating at existing um, um, generator locations on our grid. So what that means is most of the new uh, storage will be either hybrid or co-located with existing storage. Um, and there are some benefits for doing that. Obviously, there's some cost savings for the interconnection facilities, because if you've got a 100 or 200 megawatt um, solar farm and you add a 50 megawatt battery, uh, generally the battery is not going to be producing the same time as the solar farm, so you can save a little bit because you already have the interconnection infrastructure in place for that solar resource. Um, you might also be able to DC couple with the on-site solar, um, being able to charge the resource more efficiently and um, get a little bit better um, pricing incentives when you do discharge later on in the day because it doesn't cost you quite as much in terms of losses to actually charge up your resources. This is also benefit. Um, this this co-locating um, or or having hybrid resources is also beneficial to the ISO because it helps us with um, our interconnection studies. It makes them a little bit easier, and uh, we also only have uh, limited updates to do to our network models and things like that. So it does save a little bit of um, time and effort on studying these new resources as they come into our system, and we are able to expedite or have been able to expedite several of those projects as they're anticipated to come online. Um, you know, as I was mentioning with the Diablo Canyon retirement, we are expecting the CPUC to announce or authorize even further procurement of additional capacity. Um, with this tranche of capacity, we also expect the next tranche of capacity to largely be um, storage resources and stick with the same um, lithium-ion um, resources that we see in our interconnection queue right now. Uh, I do have a bullet here that says we have about 200 megawatts of storage online. That bullet is actually from an earlier version of this presentation, um, so I apologize for that. But the actual amount that we have on our system is closer to 600 megawatts right now. Um, next year, prior to summer 2021, we're expecting to be dispatching about 1,500 megawatts of capacity. And then by the end of the year, we're expected to be closer to 2,000 megawatts of capacity of just from storage and those storage numbers to continue to grow, as I mentioned, um, for the next three years with the authorization of the new procurement from the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, so, yeah, it, most of the new procurement, as I mentioned, is going to be uh, storage, and a lot of it is. Um, going to be located at the same location as existing generation, um, which means we'll have more hybrid or co-located resources on our system. And having those new storage resources on our system, independent of whether or not they are hybrid or co-located, does bring new challenges um, with it. So storage resources are most decidedly not the same as gas generation. Um, gas generation is typically able to generate on a 24 by 7 basis and provide energy over the entire period of the day. Storage doesn't actually provide any um, energy to the grid net. Um, what it does is it has the ability to store energy um, during particular times of the day and move it intertemporally to other times of the day and then deliver that energy. As I mentioned, we have and are primarily building four-hour duration storage resources um, which means they roughly have the capability of charging or storing energy for a little bit more than four hours, and then later in the day they can discharge that energy um, for about four hours of continuous output, more or less at the Pmax of the resource. Um, part of, you know, that, that next being four-hour duration comes directly from the California Public Utilities Commission requirement that a um, resource qualifying for resource adequacy is able to provide energy uh, at, on a sustained duration for four hours. So in the future, if those requirements are to change, we would also expect that the duration of energy storage um, would change as well. In other venues, we've also talked about potentially the need for longer duration storage, certainly as we get into a market where we are primarily dispatching renewable resources, we will have periods where we need um, storage duration longer than four hours. Um, the, you know, the, the period at um, the evening when there uh, might be some wind generation, but we're not getting any solar generation, um, we're certainly going to need to carry over some of that energy from the solar generation during those periods 
um, and it would certainly be longer than a four-hour period. Um, the other issue and concern um, or challenge to operating storage resources, and, and by virtue of the fact that they don't provide energy on the grid and they can't pr produce on a 24 by 7 basis, is the fact that if we are counting on storage resources to have energy during a part, certain part of the day, it's, um, it's crucial that our systems are charging those resources and the state of charge is there in the storage fleet to be able to, to use to meet our system needs. Um, and I've got a few slides just illustrating how that works um, um, coming up here. But we have developed this idea about the minimum state of charge requirement that would essentially um, require that resource adequacy storage resources have enough state of charge to meet their day ahead discharge requirements. Um, and we can ensure that in the real time market where we only have an hour uh, look ahead um, when we're thinking about the RTD five minute market, um, we will have state of charge to meet our evening net load peaks. Um, okay. Oh, uh, the one other thing I would note on this slide is, um, you know, at the behest of some um, internal folks, we have updated the name of this tool from the minimum charge requirement to the minimum state of charge requirement. I think that helps us um, um, save a little bit in terms of duplicating what I did not, I wasn't aware of, uh, but the fact that we already have an MCR tool um, internally. So making this the MSOC requirement instead of just the MCR um, tool is going to be helpful internally. So we have renamed this um, since the last version of the paper, but uh, materially we're still talking about the same concept here. So if we could advance the next slide, please. Um, I think that this will be slide 51. Um, so this is just a general graph of the expectation that we have uh, from storage resources. And essentially, we've got a couple curves here, and we're looking at data from mid-March in 2020. So this is a uh, shoulder day, and it's a bimodal uh, net load peak and, and load peak, uh, frankly. So the top line is the actual total load on the system, and that's the, the teal line you see there. Below the teal line, you see the purple line, and the purple line represents net load on the system. So in the morning hours and the evening hours, you'll notice that the purple line is a little bit below the teal line, and that generally represents um, wind output that we get from our system, um, and it does cause uh, the net load that needs to be served by other traditional, say, 24-hour, 24-by-7 generation, um, a little bit lower than the actual load. And then you notice in the middle part of the day, the purple line is significantly lower than the teal line, um, and that represents uh, the solar generation as well as the wind generation, but primarily solar generation on the system, uh, which you can tell uh, offsets the load by several thousand megawatts. Um, so the other thing to note about the purple line is that our prices and our real-time market are highly correlated with the purple line. So when the purple line is lower, it means we're generally lower on our supply stack on the system. When the purple line is higher, we're generally higher on the supply stack in the system which means um, market prices, generally at the system level, are lower during the lowest net load periods of the day and higher and highest during the highest net load periods of the day. Um, so we already have this sort of built-in economic incentive um, for storage resources to charge or to buy energy um, from the market during those lowest periods of the day uh, when our net load is low and then to discharge that energy during the highest price periods of the day, during the high net load peaks of the day. And what those storage resources are doing is when they're discharging, they're essentially offsetting our most expensive resources on our grid. And when they're charging, they're essentially absorbing um, energy that might be marginal from our uh, solar or wind resources on our system or our lowest cost gas resources on the system um, if we're thinking about this, the, these economics happening at the margin. Um, so what we would expect here today on this particular day in March 17th, if the price spread is sufficient um, between the lowest price periods of the day and the highest price periods of the day, that the storage resources would be charging during the middle part of the day represented by the blue shaded area on this graph, and then they'd be discharging during um, the highest net load peak 
periods of the day, which would be the green shaded areas. Um, so you'd see charging for a certain number of megawatt hours during the middle of the day and then discharging in the evening peak and then discharging in the morning peak as well. Um, okay. And, and of course, in the, in the um, real-time market, the actual charge and discharge schedules would be determined by the bid parameters from those resources and the actual realized LMPs at that resources location. So if we can advance to the next slide, um, this shows a very similar graph, but on a different day, different time of the year. So here we're actually looking at one of those um, net uh, peak load days of, our, of the year here, and you'll notice it's back in August. So this is August 16th, 2020. Um, again, you can see the teal line at the top representing total load on our system. It peaks at over 42,000 megawatts. Um, you can also see the purple line below that, which again represents net load, so that's load, total load, less wind and solar generation. Um, you can see that there's not a whole lot of wind in the morning, but there is some in the evening. And then there still is a significant amount of solar resources online during the middle part of the day causing that purple line to sort of trough around hour ending 9 and hour ending 10. Um, again, those would be the hours of the day when we expect to see the lowest prices in our real-time market. And then we'd see higher prices um, later on in the day in hour ending 19, uh, 20, and 21. Um, I've also done a little bit of extra um, doctoring of this graph. I've put a, a, a blue square on the graph at about, I don't know, uh, maybe 35, 36,000 megawatts or something. So this is supposed to represent an idea of, well, say if we do retire some of these gas resources and we do retire um, you know, Diablo Canyon, and now we have less 24 by seven generation, perhaps this blue box is something that could represent the uh, total dependable 24 by seven generation and, and in terms of capacity value. And then uh, you'll notice that the 24 by 7 capacity here doesn't quite reach the top of the uh, net load curve. So if we didn't have any other generation outside of our renewables and the 24 by 7 generation, we essentially wouldn't be able to serve load during all hours of the day. But we also have um, this red box, which it rep represents here you know, purely hypothetical um, four-hour duration storage resources that are online. And again, the height of that box represents the total capacity from those storage resources. And you can see that those storage resources, as long as they're charged, would be available to serve um, peak net load and we could maintain reliability over the entire 24 hours of the day. Um, you'd also note that the difference between the purple line in this graph and the blue box, where the purple line exceeds the blue box, that's the total amount of energy in terms of megawatt hours or gigawatt hours that that those storage resources would need to serve, and in this case, they would critically need to serve those. It's not saying that they couldn't serve more um, if they're economic to do so, but they would need to be charged um, for these hours in order um, for the ISO, again, to maintain reliability. And our expectation is, um, particularly when we set this problem up in the day-ahead market, that these resources would be charging during the lowest price hours of the day, which, again, tend to correspond to hour ending 9 and 10 in this graph, where the peak net loads are lowest and then have that state of charge ready um, for the evening or um, potentially if they have a, a state of charge in excess of what's required for the evening, they could discharge that earlier in the day or um, during those peak net load hours when prices are highest and it's most economic for them to do so. Um, so the tool that we're really developing here uh, with the minimum state of charge requirement is to ensure um, that we do have that state of charge to meet our peak net loads at the end of the day. Um, on the next slide, I, I kind of show a graphic here that was included in the report as well. Um, there's actually quite a number of moving pieces that are specific to storage resources in this document. And I think all of them sort of work in concert together. So we have it, you know, I know that the presentations have been spread out over three days and across um, different members of our team, uh, but we really have all been working together to make sure that, um, you know, when you put this together, each of these parts work together and we get a solution that provides reliability, but it also provides flexibility to um, resources that we have on our system um, when they're needed. So in the day, and I just wanted to kind of um, illustrate how all those, all those parts work together um, in, this, in this very simple um, picture or, or figure here. 
So essentially in the day ahead market, um, we are requiring the storage resources, and this is similar to uh, the muster offer obligation we have today, uh, bid into the day ahead market on a 24 by seven basis. We also, um, and this is a, a piece of policy from the ESDER 4 initiative, but we're also imposing market power mitigation on those resources. So even if we do get in a situation like I described on the last slide, where we absolutely need storage resources to serve the peak load, because of market power mitigation, those storage resources can't exert um, market power on the grid and artificially increase prices up to say, you know, $1,000 at, at the uh, ceiling. Um, so with these two features, the most offer obligation and the market power mitigation, and um, the, the, the bids that we receive from the rest of the resources bidding into the day at market, we do get an efficient 24-hour schedule for both storage resources and the rest of the fleet, you know, the traditional gas fleet operating on our system. Um, what this means is we will effectively be charging storage resources and discharging resources according to their bid curves and according to the energy needs that we see in the day ahead market. Um, so we will be charging energy, uh, storage essentially when prices are lowest and discharging them when prices are highest. And keeping in mind, um, our, our day ad market will charge resource, storage resources specifically um, so that they can meet the needs of um, peak net loads. And again, this is still a, a cost optimization problem, and we'll do that in um, the, the least cost manner uh, in order to come up with that solution. So once we have that solution in the day ahead market, we can then move to the real time market. Um, as we heard earlier, we have must offer obligations um, at the day ahead schedule, similar to other resources in the real time market. Um, resources will be required um, via this minimum state of charge tool to maintain certain state uh, levels of state of charge during certain conditions um, when we feel, uh, you know, the ISO runs a test and that test determines that those storage resources are needed to meet the uh, peak debt loads like I talked about in the last slide. And then finally, again, from ESDER 4, we also have market power mitigation that will be applied in the real-time market um, to ensure that even if storage resources are pivotal, they can't exert market power and extract rents from the market um, when system conditions or, or local conditions are particularly tight. Okay, uh, moving on to the next slide. And um, after this, I think this is all the material that I have to present, um, but I will pause for questions and, um, and, and have a dialogue with uh, stakeholders on the call. Um, so we have received, uh, we have received a bit of feedback um, from stakeholders about the minimum state of charge requirement. Um, we tried to take into consideration as much of that feedback as possible. Uh, I think there's still, you know, I, I, I don't, personally, I don't think that this is necessarily the uh, long-term solution that the ISO is going to stick with. I think we're going to continue to develop and evolve this solution and potentially other solutions. Um, so that we can get the best solution in place um, that hopefully most of our storage community is comfortable with and, and um, you know, compensate these resources for the products that they're providing in the market. Um, in the meantime, and I think with the timeline that we are working with right now for the delivery of um, what we can do uh, for the fall of 2021, I think this is, this is really the best solution um, that we've come up with. And in previous presentations, we've talked about other potential solutions. Um, obviously, you know, if we part, part of the problem in the real-time market comes from the limited look-ahead uh, in the real-time market. If we had a 10-hour look-ahead or a 12-hour look-ahead, we'd be able to see uh, low price periods and the peak periods, peak hours of the day when storage resources are needed, um, and we'd be able to optimally charge and discharge the storage resources Today, of course, we only have a look ahead that goes out um, 65 minutes in the RTD market. So, um, you, you know, one potential solution is to expand that real-time market. Uh, but frankly, given technology limitations and the amount of time that developing something like that would take, 
Uh, it's just not feasible right now, um, which isn't to say we'll never tackle that problem, but for now it, it, it's just not feasible. I think another solution, I think this is a more drastic and uh, draconian solution, is you know, simply copying over day ahead schedules into the real time schedule and any time storage resources have a day ahead schedule, just preclude them at all from uh, participating in the real time market. I, we, you know, we've heard very strongly that the storage community objects to those kinds of measures um, and they see it as discriminatory. And, you know, I think the ISO also sees that we'd be missing out on, you know, flexible generating capacity at those times. So we'd really have some challenges, um, or we could have challenges operating our system um, if we completely precluded storage resources from, from dealing in our real-time market. Um, so I don't think we, we don't really want to go down that path either. So sort of what we've settled on here is, is a, somewhat of a middle ground. Um, and, I, and like I said, I think there, are, there is room um, for expansion, and obviously there's other solutions in the three that I've just outlined, um, and we might consider those solutions as we move forward. But um, what we're proposing here today, and I think in addition to, um, you know, where we've been in the past, we've also made some improvements and enhancements in this specific tool. Um, for example, the um, minimum state of charge requirement will continue to perform essentially how we provide, how we outlined the performance of the tool in the previous paper. Um, essentially what it'll do is it'll look at they had schedules. It'll say, hey, if um, resources are scheduled to be discharged in the day ahead market, um, we are going to go ahead and ensure that they have state of charge available to meet those discharge schedules. Um, so the actual mechanics of the tool um, and, and the desired outcome hasn't really changed much. However, what we have done is, first of all, we've clarified that this tool will only be applied to resource adequacy resources. Um, and I think that was always the intention of this tool as long as it's been in the RA enhancements policy. Um, so we're really not looking to expand this to all storage. Um, if you don't want these kinds of um, you know, impositions placed on your resources, uh, just, just simply don't participate in the resource adequacy market and you won't have any kind of restriction on how you can operate in the real-time market. Um, so uh, part of our view on this is if you are procured for resource adequacy, part of what you are signing up for is providing reliability to operations of the grid for the ISO, and part of what we're going to need those resources for um, from time to time will be state of charge to meet those net load peaks um, on specific days. Um, second, the ISO is proposing a rule to uh, only apply this requirement on the most critical days. Um, essentially, and you can read a little bit more about this in the text of the document, but essentially we are proposing that this only, this requirement only applies on days when non-storage resources can't meet 100% of the net load. And that would be the net load that's calculated from the day at market, and we, we just simply compare all uh, non-LESR resources to the total net load, and if the non-LESR resources were sufficient to meet that net load, we would not imply, or I'm sorry, we would not apply this minimum state of charge requirement on any of the storage fleet, um, and it would simply be exempt on those days. The idea here is that on particularly tight days, we would be applying the constraint um, on other days we wouldn't. Um, I have been asked, in meetings outside of this one, if we could do some analysis on how often we thought this constraint might be applied. Um, I do hope to have that analysis done by the final proposal, but I haven't done that at this point. Um, the third item that we've added is a requirement that um, instead of applying state of charge whenever the resource is charged in the day ahead market, we would instead apply the requirement at the later of when the resource is charged in the day ahead market or the lowest price intervals on market. So one of the concerns that we had from several stakeholders was, well, what happens if a storage resource comes into the day at a full state of charge and then later in the day when prices are high, they discharge their full capacity? Now suddenly this minimum state of charge requirement 
um, requires that the resource maintain 100% state of charge throughout the entire day until the evening, which is very unfair because there's going to be, or there could be, opportunities to discharge, say, during the morning peak, and then opportunities to recharge when prices are lower during um, the peak net, or, or the lowest net load periods when solar starts to come online and load still hasn't ramped up um, for the later afternoon or the evening. Um, so taking that into consideration, we've reformatted how we want to apply the requirement, and um, we've determined that the requirement could either be applied when the resource is charged, so if this happens later in the day, that would be fine, or um, during hours when um, the resource is, uh, or, or during hours when the LNPs are lowest at that resource's location. Um, and I, I think that kind of um, comes to a nice middle ground um, in not applying these resources uh, for the full day and allowing a little bit more flexibility in terms of how these resources actually operate in the real-time market. I think a lot of the other things that we've talked about previously um, continue to apply here. Uh, this is just simply a minimum state of charge. It doesn't necessarily preclude a resource from operating anywhere above this state of charge. So storage um, it is charged to a state of charge above that minimum state of charge. It would still respond uh, normally to real-time dispatch instructions so it could be charging, it could be discharging. Um, we don't really care as long as we have that specific state of charge. And again, that would be something that would be determined by the day ahead market. Okay, um, those are all the slides I have. Um, I know there's a few questions on the phone, um, so let's go ahead and open up the lines. Okay, one moment. Call your lines unmuted, please go ahead. Hi, Gabe. This is Mike Castellano from the CPUC Energy Division. How's it going? Hi, Mike. Pretty good. Thanks. Um, so I guess I'll just start off by saying I have said this many times before, but I think this whole proposal is a really bad idea. I think it's definitely discriminatory. It restricts storage resources from participating in the real-time market in a way that no other resource is restricted. Um, and it, it's all based on shortcomings of the ISO markets. There's nothing really specific about storage resources that makes this, this necessary. It's the fact that your real-time market doesn't see both sides of the storage transaction. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you guys say you can't technically figure out how to extend the market outlook, but a few years ago you were talking about pushing it out to 18 hours, I think. There was an extended stuck um, initiative a few years back that uh, a lot of people at the ISO were very gung-ho on. So I'm not sure what the difference is now that you can't extend the outlook. But, um, you know, just the, the reason for all this really is the shortcomings of the ISO's real-time market. And I think that, you know, what you guys are proposing here is at best, acceptable as an emergency stopgap measure while you design the expansions to the real-time market. Um, but given the circumstances, I, I don't even know why that's necessary. We've already missed summer 2021, right? We're gonna have something like 3,000 megawatts of storage that um, my guess is it's gonna mostly be manually dispatched for a lot of the summer whenever there's a hot day or whenever operators are concerned about load conditions. Um, and by summer 2022, I would think we have time to do something better than this. Uh, in terms of the justification for this proposal and why you guys are saying it's okay, um, you have a lot of stuff in the paper about how the day ahead gives you a 20, an efficient 24-hour schedule. You also have some things where you talk about possibly extending the outlook, but pointing out that the forecasts will change and the information will change so that, you know, what you think a battery is going to do six hours in advance of flow time might not correspond to what happens at flow time. That's true. That information is going to change but it's going to be more accurate six hours ahead than 30 hours ahead. You guys are constraining resources based on information that, you, that is available to you at 10 a.m. the day before. And that, that's, you know, it's, it's 
the, the, all the arguments you make about why you can't extend the real-time outlook based on information changing, you know, are, are sort of comical because you're going to do this all with much, much older information. And that efficient 24-hour schedule is only efficient based on that old information mm -hmm. and the parameters of the day ahead market. The parameters of the real-time market are different. All the other resources that are participating in the real-time market are going to be scheduled differently, even just for granularity differences, let alone all the load and everything else that can change, are going to be scheduled differently in the real time than they are in the day ahead. The 24-hour efficient schedule that's coming out of the day ahead for storage resources is therefore no longer efficient. And so, you know, that statement that you have an efficient 24-hour schedule is not true anymore. You're constraining these resources to an inefficient schedule. You say that you guys aren't doing something so draconian as restricting them to their day ahead schedule, but in practical application, that's what's going to happen, I think. I think any resource that is scheduled to go anywhere near full charge and discharge on a day like this is going to ride a self-schedule into the real-time market because there's no real reason to play with the risks of not doing so. And I think, I, you know, I haven't heard the ISO really seriously talk about trying to work on something that's going to be better than this. I think this is going to lead to storage not making any money, or not making as much money as they could, not providing the services they could. It's going to lead to increased reliance on greenhouse gas resources for further out into the future than we're planning on right now. And, you know, until you guys have something on the horizon that you're working towards, to make it better, I don't see why this is any kind of an acceptable solution. Well, um, yeah, Mike, I, I certainly appreciate your perspective. Um, and, you know, I think some of the things that I noted in the presentation kind of agree with the, the comments that you're making here. Um, and and I, I think, uh, you know, you're right. We, we should continue to work towards um, you know, you know, something that's, that's potentially better than this solution. Um, but at this point, yeah, we haven't come up with anything to propose yet, and I don't think we're willing to say that we're going to move in that direction right now. Um, okay. I don't understand why you can't move in the direction of expanding the real-time market outlook. That's the, act that's the solution that makes sense for so many different ways and for things beyond storage. And, like yeah. I said, it's yeah. something the ISO was trying to do a couple of years ago. Yeah, no, I, I understand the comment. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, operator, next call, please. Okay. Caller, please. Yeah, hi. Ahead. Yeah, hi. This is Inside. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Susan. Okay. Well, I was a little disappointed that we weren't going to go through this in a little more detail because I have, actually have a lot of questions. I'll try to be, I'll try to restrain myself here. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to reconcile this idea that um, the assumption seems to be that the resource is going to charge up earlier in the day and then discharge later with the idea that, for example, one of the things we talked about on day one was that the supply cushion hours, there's sort of a, you know, most of them are going to be in the either type supply cushion hours will be in the evening, but some of them also will be in the morning, and they could be tapping in at any time during the day. And so it, it almost, I, I'm trying to figure out, if you take a look on, for example, on page 51, where you're assuming that, um, that you're going to have a discharge early in the day and you're going to have a discharge later in the day. Well, somehow, if you kind of start with the later in the day when there's a big discharge, somehow to be ready for that morning, there's going to have to be some charging that happens at night, potentially at least. And so if, if a resource is charging a little bit or charging at night to try and do that morning discharge, are they allowed to, but they're playing in the real-time market, is, is this going to, let's say the morning discharge turns out to be less than expected, are they, um, are they going to not be able to, 
Uh, yeah, they're not going to be able to, to do any – anyway, I'm trying to figure out how, to, how, how they're going to actually operate with this dual kind of discharge during the day. Um, if the real time turns out to be a little different than the day ahead, and maybe that's, um, that's, that's kind of – this is the point that was being made earlier with the CPC. Um, so, you know, it could be that they're actually going to be needed at different times during the day, and they will be able to charge up. But for example, how are they going to know – which hours are going to be okay to do this where there's going to be the lowest price wherever they are? How are they going to know in advance which, if, if, if they can charge, if they, if they have to use the minimum state of charge the later of when they, um, when they're scheduled to do it based on the 24-7 schedule or when there's the lowest prices, uh, how, how are they going to know when the lowest prices are? And they're going to know when prices are, look kind of low. But how will they know? How will they know when the lowest prices are in advance? Is there? I'm just not understanding how this is going to be workable. Oh yeah, um, you know we've developed a formula um, that that determines how the state of charge is going to be calculated. And you're exactly right. For a day like um, March 17, 2020, if there are discharge schedules um, in the morning peak and the evening peak and those schedules are from resource adequacy storage resources, and this is a day when the 24 by 7 generation can't meet the net load peak, then we would apply this constraint. And, you know, exactly like you say, if storage resources are scheduled to discharge in the morning, then there would be hours before that period when the resources would need to charge, and the day ahead market would ensure that that happens. Um, so those schedules from the day ahead market or the lowest price period prior to the morning peak would essentially set a minimum state of charge requirement for these resources um, prior to the discharge period. And then the same thing would happen in the evening. Okay. But, but, it, but you're, you're basically allowing them to, to meet the minimum charge or to try to uh, – this idea of the, 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 that they have to meet the minimum charge the later of when the – um, when when the, the day ahead schedule says to do that, or they somehow can charge during the lowest hours, lowest price hours in real time, how will they know that? Okay, it looks like it's a low price, but how will they know that that's the lowest price hours? It's the lowest price hours in the day ahead market, not the real time market. Okay, so when you say the requirement will be applied to later of a charge scheduled or the lowest prices. You're going to release a forecast of lowest prices, lowest priced hours, or a price forecast of some kind, so that they will know when this will be applied. It's the day ahead LMPs that are the prices that will be used at that resources location. Okay, so they will they be able will they be able to tell with the information that they have. So the, the, if the charge is scheduled at the lowest price hours and it's the later of the two, they're going to, they're going to, are they going to know what hours this is going to be applied from what you are releasing in the market? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. Um, I, you know, we, we hadn't gotten into those details, but I, uh, I presume that we could share that information with the storage resources. Okay, because, because you know they have the day ahead schedule, but but it seems to me like they won't they won't necessarily. And so all of this is based on day ahead, right? Correct. Okay. Well, what happens if? Um, in, okay. Okay. So that's I think that's the first question. If they can actually know, you know, you're going to tell them what hour this requirement is going to apply. I think that is that's an important thing for them to know. Okay. The second thing is, let's say you're approaching. Let's go to. Um, you know, let's say you're approaching on this graph hours, you know, hour ending 15, 17, and it turns out that the hours that, um, it, that the, the net load peak is a little earlier than you expected. Okay, sure. it starts earlier than you expected, all right? And, and, and so the real time, the, the high, high real time prices will start a little earlier, and you're trying to make sure that they don't discharge earlier because you need them for those later times, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, what if it means, what if because of forecast issues, what if it really means that you do actually need, those are the tight supply cushion times and the prices are high, and you really do need them like an hour ending 17. Um, 
but yeah. you're going to make them restrain them from being able to discharge then so they'll be available later, but maybe it's just that you, the peak has shifted a little bit in real time and you actually do mm-hmm. need them earlier, but you're not going to allow them to give you that service, right? Yeah, this is a, um, you know, this is a market constraint. Um, so like other constraints in the market, it can be relaxed. So if there was a situation where we were approaching like an infeasibility or if prices were very high at this specific location, we could allow or we will allow the actual minimum state of charge at a particular resource to be relaxed um, during that interval. Um, so so if, if there was a situation where we were approaching the feasibility, we could get that, you know, we could get generation from any resource on the system um, because we would be sending very high price signals and that would essentially um, override the constraints in the market that, that say, hey, look, I want to hold on to this state of charge. So that, well, I, I think that sort of behavior that you're implying is possible. Well, okay, but, but how will they know that? For example, they, they know that, oh, I've got a day head schedule and I, and I, you know, I have to hold the minimum state of charge here because I, my day head schedule says oh. I have to do this. But how will they know that it's, that you're, it's okay to relax it? How would they, how would they know that? Oh, this is a, this is a, um, a, a requirement that's imposed from the ISO software. This isn't something that they have to go out and procure on their own. Okay, so they will. They, so a storage, a storage resource would bid, um, you know, uh, a price spread like they normally do, where you bid some price to charge and some price to discharge. And if if real time prices were higher than their discharge price, they'd be discharged. If real time prices were lower than their charge price, they'd be charged in the real time market. But for um, this market constraint that says, hey, I know that you have a schedule. Um, to discharge 50 megawatt hours this evening, so I'm going to hold you at 50 megawatt hours of state of charge um, in, in the real-time market. Okay, so the way that this would be applied and, normally yeah. is that is it, if there – I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, so the way this would be applied normally is that they would have bids, they would put in bids that you would if you, would, if you, wanted, to, if you wanted them to hold the state of charge – they would put in bids, and you just simply, even though they might otherwise clear the market, you would just not accept those bids because you don't want them to discharge at that time. That's not something they have exactly. to consciously do. It's just that it'll, it'll look, it might look weird to them because it looks like their bids should have cleared, but they didn't. But the reason they wouldn't have cleared is because the software will hold them and not allow them to discharge when it would otherwise be economic. Correct. Okay, that's an important thing to understand and to understand that this is a software issue and not something that they have to monitor themselves. Okay, it's just something they have to understand to understand how their resource is being dispatched. Okay, let me ask a question about non-storage. It says here non-storage resources, and when you were talking about, uh, I'm sorry, I'm on on the slide 54 now. Um, It says here non-storage, and I think that's the way it's put in the proposal. And then you talked about non-lesser resources. Are those, yeah. are those uh, uh, which one, those are not necessarily the same thing. Yeah, um, in, this, in this case, when we say non-storage, we mean non-LESR resources. So any other resource on the market could be used to meet the, um, you know, 110% of net load when we're doing our tests on whether or not we would apply the minimum state of charge requirement. Okay. So is this, when you say non-LESR, um, do they have to be RA resources? Um, I think we might have specified in the paper that they did need to be RA resources um, because we want resources that we can depend on their capacity. Okay, but if they're already bid in, so this is all happening day ahead, right, after you've done the day ahead market run. And so you would know Correct. if there were non-RA resources, non-RA, non-LESR resources that had already been bid. And so it's not like there's a must-offer obligation thing or you wonder if they're going to be bid into the market, in which they don't have an obligation to do, but they would have already, you would know if they had cleared the market at that time. So you're saying that even if they, they bid into the market, they have a day ahead schedule, they're not RA resources, um, you still wouldn't count them in 110%? Yeah, let me think about that. Um, I, think that's a, I think that's a decent point. Um, if you could put that in your written comments, we could, um, you know, think further about that. Okay. All right. Um, 
And uh, let me see if I have any other. Oh yeah, this this um this doesn't apply to storage in a hybrid resource. Does it? This is just standalone and co-located storage. Correct. Okay. All right. That's it. All right. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm gonna. I have a lot of other questions, but I think I will spend the time not not take over the rest of it. I know you only have an hour left here, um, but we'll, yep. put, we'll try and put them in comments. But we still, at if, if the draft final proposal stage, there is still a huge amount of questions for this, and, and I think it's um, you might have to give some thought to that. Yeah, um, so. if, if you've got other questions specifically, um, yeah, just feel, feel free to um, send them my way, and then hopefully we can talk through some of them. Okay. What's the um, – and I apologize if I'm taking Isabel Thunder for later, but um, you're going to have another conversation about things like must offer obligations. It's also really important here. Um, next Friday, what does that mean for the comment, comment deadline for, for this? The elements – this is Isabella. Um, the elements that we have discussed um, so far during these weeks, this week's meetings, those comments will still be due on January 21st. Um, but we will have another comments deadline for the must offer obligation and the minimum system RA requirement um, and maybe some of backstop. Um, and those will be due on the 29th. 29th, okay. All right. Um, anyway, we'll have to go those. There's going to be some back and forth here, but, uh, but thanks for that information. Okay, operator, next call, please. Okay, call your line is unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, I had I had similar um, you know perspectives I think as um, Mike and Susan, but I think I want to articulate a couple different concerns. Um, the first one is this to me reflects the odd lack in faith of the Kaiso's existing storage tools and real time market prices. I mean, because it, it seems like you could either have this. Um, uh, you know, out of market um, administrative constraint, or you could trust that your end of hour state of charge tool, plus the desire for a scheduling coordinator to maximize revenues, actually will lead them to be able to discharge at the appropriate periods of time. Um, you know, if you say real time prices are supposed to reflect real time need. Um, then to me, it seems very odd to constrain people to a day ahead financial market that isn't intended to actually reflect um, when your exact resource is supposed to be needed. Um, you know, a day ahead market has virtuals in it, for example. We run a rock process after all. That schedule isn't intended, it's a financial market. It's not intended to reflect when your resource will be needed perfectly. So I, I have a hard time with this because even when you look at August 14th and you look at the day ahead prices and when the issue started in day ahead compared to real time, um, that, um, you know, that effect that Susan said, what happens if you're needed earlier? Well, that did happen. And that happened on a day when we needed probably storage resources the most. So I mean, completely aside of storage having, you know, trying to get arbitrage opportunities, I just, I fundamentally struggle with this being the right reliability constraint because ultimately, typically you only have a constraint in the market if one, you don't trust your tools, and two, you don't trust your operators to be able to exceptionally dispatch if those tools don't work. So given that we have had no actual evidence that this is an issue, why does the CAISO have this angst where it feels like this is needed? Yeah, I, you know, I, I understand and appreciate the, the question, and I think this is, you know, this has been brought up in other uh, meetings as well. Um, you know, our, our perspective is that, you know, like that, that graph that we showed um, a few slides ago where we had net load that would exceed the amount of uh, generation that we could provide from 24 by 7 resources, um, in the event that a storage resource or the storage fleet is not charged during those periods, um, we, you know, the ISO would not be able to serve load. Um, so instead of, you know, waiting for the lights to go out on the one day when the storage resources aren't charged, 
um, we're going to put something in the market that ensures that if we know we need storage resources on our fleet um, to operate the grid reliably, we're going to have them have a state of charge and be ready uh, to, to meet the requirements of the system. But, Gabe, do you see that? I you know, find that to be a really odd what if. What if resources with only one start per day started up in the morning and then decided to turn off in the middle of the day and then couldn't start up in the afternoon? There are lots of resources with only one start a day, and they don't do that mm -hmm. because the crisis markets usually work, right? I mean, that's the whole purpose of running a market and not doing command and control. So your what if literally to me is saying, what if people don't appropriately respond to market signals? And if you want to go down that what if, well, then I think you have to say, okay, we need to put this in place for resources with only one start. Okay, we need to put this in place for resources that can only, um, you know, that have strong opportunity costs and are use limited. Um, and we need to put it in a constraint across an entire month because what if they only have a certain number of starts per month and they're not there because the load impact happens at the end of the month. There's a, a lot of what if you could do. Um, but the point of running a market is that people respond to signals and the market dictates, um, you know, when resources are dispatched. Not, again, it, to me this is a very fear, un, unbacked by data, fear-based proposal. And I understand the crisis doesn't want the lights to go out. I don't want the lights to go out. No one does. But I just don't think this is the right proposal. Yeah, and I certainly don't think we're um, saying that storage resources aren't motivated by economic incentives. Um, I think they are motivated by economic incentives, and I think we are saying that they would act rationally in our market. Um, I think th one of the primary concerns that we have is that if prices materialize at high levels prior to those evening peaks and discharge the fleet, there would be – you know, there would be no resources available, storage resources, to meet those evening peaks. And, and that's where our concern is. And we're not saying that, you know, every day we need all the storage resources charged to meet these evening peaks. We're saying if, you know, we drop load 10% of the time during the evening um, while storage resources are making, you know, a, a certain amount of profit earlier in the day, these, um, you know, storage resources would still find it economically viable to continue to, you know, disregard day ahead schedules where they were being discharged later in the day um, and make more money in the real time market by discharging early, you know, uh, a certain percentage of the time. And then on that off chance that we do drop load, for us, it's a much more, um, you know, it, it, it's a much worse outcome on, on that, you know, one in 10 day when we do drop load. Um, than, than the economic incentives where, um, you know, 90% of the time these resources could be making money earlier in the day. I think, one, that that what if is probably, if that happened, that would only happen once because storage resources want to maximize revenue. So if there's a load event later in the day, that's when prices would be higher. So they want to be around for that. But, two, I could do what if, too. I could say what if that new Great Vista resource, Moss Landing, right, a local resource, has this minimum constraint on it, and another resource in that local out in that local area goes on outage, right? And forced outages happen at any time, and storage is being depended on in that local area. If there is a minimum constraint that won't let that storage resource respond to a local area need, which it would if it was allowed to dispatch in prices but instead it's hanging around for its day ahead schedule, you could drop load in the local area too. This is why no, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think not, I asked the same question earlier, and, and, and I think our response is the same, that you know, these, these constraints could be relaxed, and if, if we are in danger of dropping load or if we're in danger of an infeasibility, um, we would choose to relax this constraint and discharge the resource and not have the infeasibility. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that I think that result is captured. Um, I, 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 yeah, Terry, I, I do appreciate your comments. Um, okay. Thank I know you. we have a number of other people on the phone. Yeah, but but I, um, if you have anything else to follow up with, um, you know, send me um, 
send me an email and we can chat about it. Um, operator, can we go on to the next call, please? And I know I just have a few more minutes, so we'll take a few more calls and then uh, we can move on to the next topic. Next call, your line's unmuted. Hey, Gabe, it's Chris Seven from Customized Energy Solutions. Um, so hey, I'm not going to belabor all the points that everybody else made, but I would just lend my voice to that, the same issues that my Castellano raised, some of the things that Susan said, and certainly what Carrie just mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, you know, we're, we're certainly not um, disregarding any of those comments. We take all these comments very seriously. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, e even the ISO would agree that this is not the probably the best permanent solution, um, but it's sort of with the storage, the volume of storage resources that we see coming on the system, I think we need something in place um, in the near term. And I think this is what, this is the best, products that we've come up with to date. Um, we're going to continue to evolve this product and um, hopefully develop something that's, that's more long-term, that's more palatable and market-driven um, for everybody. But I appreciate that, Chris. Um, operator, next call, please. Caller, please go ahead. Hello, Gabe. Uh, this is Alva Eugenie. Can you hear me? Hey, Alva. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'll, my questions are, are uh, assuming that this does get implemented, um, uh, or maybe there, there are quite things to, to, to consider. Um, one, I, I did uh, sort of along the lines of what Susan was talking about, I think there is an issue um, with uh, the possibility of uh, discharges in the morning peak causing you to violate the, uh, the minimum state of charge later based on the rules that you've got, you might not be able to um, get sufficient state of charge for the evening peak uh -huh. after a particularly, you know, high prices in the morning peak. So you may, may want to consider whether that minimum state of charge uh, rule needs to be implemented actually in some way to, to prevent, uh, you know, over, over discharge during earlier periods as well as undercharging. Uh, it's just something to consider. Um, another um, question or thing to consider is whether you're, you'd be having, you'd be putting any uh, restrictions on or, or potentially having buyback of, of uh, regulation up if it appeared that the, uh, the minimum charge constraint was going to be violated in real time. Because you, you, presumably you're looking at the, in the real time, you're always looking at the telemetered state of charge as your starting point um, and then trying to enforce your minimum state of charge from there and what happens if you've, um, if reg up has, has overutilized a, a, a resource. So that'll be another thing to keep in mind in looking at how you enforce the minimum state of charge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. A third issue just to, to have a some idea of how you're going to address it is what happens if there's a, a partial um, D rate on state of charge on a, on a resource um, so that it's not able to provide the minimum state of charge. Um, do you just go to the, what, what do you do in that case anyway? That's, the, that's the, just a question to, to address. Um, and then basically I wanted to again, sort of chime in on what Susan was talking about to ask that it's very important that this, the minimum state of charge be available to uh, resources when they're bidding in real time. So, it, in fact, they should know what it is going to be prior to putting in bids because you should actually, uh, it, it, sh it should interact with the business rules um, for the new uh, state of charge target um, which will be part of the real-time bids effectively, um, or at least it will be, essentially it's going to be processed at the same time in the, time, in the mm -hmm. same time frame in the market processes. And one concern I would have is that um, you, you need to know uh, what, what the uh, business rules are in terms of if there is a minimum state of charge that the ISO plans to enforce, what, is, what are you allowed to do in terms of the, uh, the real-time uh, target setting. Can you set a fixed, uh, does it restrict you from 
fixing the target? Does it um, does it set a minimum on the state of charge target that you can put in? If you put in a minimum state of charge target that's higher than that minimum state of charge target, is that fine? And then does that allow you to um, essentially uh, go, go forward from that point? Uh, or um, does it get overwritten by the minimum state of charge uh, after the bids have been put in? So that, that kind of thing is really important to uh, nail down, I think, at, at this point where you're, you're getting down to, to more of the the details of this and the time frame is, is, is quite compressed now, especially with the, uh, the state of charge target um, yeah. implemented yeah. this year. So I just asked for, you know, something that's a lot clearer in its definition. I understand that you're trying to deal with some of the controversy that's also being raised at the same time that sort of is challenging the whole construct, but um, assuming that the construct is going to be proposed, uh, the details are really important. Uh, for making mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. uh, avoiding um, situations in which uh, people can't put in bids effectively, you know, because uh, you, yeah. you've, you've boxed them into a place where they can't put in a bid. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, we do have in the paper some discussion about what kind of bids we, you know, we would accept um, through the, you know, real-time market bid submission process. And you're exactly right. For things like minimum state of charge, you certainly could enter a manual end of hour uh, minimum state of charge that would be above the uh, minimum state of charge requirement that would be set by this tool. Um, and that would right. be fine. But what you couldn't do is go in and set a maximum state of charge that's below the minimum state of charge requirement. Right. So there's sort of that's a number of operations. Um, and I think we have talked a little bit about that in um, the storage resource. Uh, bidding section of the paper, um, but yeah, we could, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that offline, and of course, we would be uh, developing business requirements and circulating those right. um, publicly as well. As, as That's, we right. That's right. Sounds good, and, and just to note that that really does imply, as Susan suggested, that this data needs to be available uh, when bids are being yeah. constructed by market participants. Yeah, I think that would be. I, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, you know, that is that. I, I will admit that that is one one aspect of this proposal we haven't really fleshed out. Thanks, kid. But yeah, I, I appreciate the comments, Alva. Thank you. Um, I think we're at three twenty. Um, I think we have time for one more comment. Um, I would ask that anybody else in the queue, uh, please, you know, uh, reach out to me or uh, individually and just send me an email, and we can we can chat about some of the questions or. Um, you know, uh, please, please put comments in uh, for, for the written comments. But we can do one more question, and then we'll move on to the next um, uh, the next subject here. Okay, your line's unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Renee Seiken from LS Power. Um, just, I guess, a few additional questions to clarify. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned before on the 110% of the load requirement, mm -hmm. um, that you were going to be doing some additional analysis on that. So, you know, as you're doing that, it would be helpful to know, you know how you came up with that number on 110% and if there's maybe some sensitivities mm -hmm. on what um, higher or lower would be. And especially as, as more storage resources come online, um, how that would change, you know, the number of days that it's expected to be uh, imposed. Um, and then second, one thing that's not on the slide here um, but that is in the paper is a discussion on the, the local areas. And I was wondering if you could explain that more, um, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, to attaining uh, the certain state of charge to maintain reliability in a local area in the event of an yeah. M-1 uh, contingency. So is, is that um, just only on specific days when that's expected or, or what? Yeah, um, yeah, for your first question, um, yeah, we do intend to, uh, you know, we have started collecting data um, and we are intending to put out some kind of analysis of that data to say when we would expect these, these requirements to be imposed. Um, and I'm hoping to have that out by the final proposal. Uh, but I, I do think that that's important as we move forward with this um, constraint. Um, for your second question, yeah, I, I apologize for that. I think this might have been a versioning issue because um, I did have a slide deck where that was mentioned, um, and, this, and it doesn't appear to be in here. 
Um, so, yeah, if, if there are results um, that come out of um, the local markets where storage resources charge for local reliability concerns, uh, we would also feed that information through to the uh, minimum state of charge requirement tool. So essentially the, the same kinds of things would happen. Um, you know, let's just say your storage resource wasn't committed for, you know, system needs, but instead was uh, committed for local needs and it was charged up for those local requirements, um, you know, over some period of time in the evening. Um, this minimum state of charge requirement would enforce um, those states of charge in the real-time market so that essentially that state of charge would be held through um, the real-time market and we'd, we'd have it there. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. And, you know, just to emphasize the previous comment or, you know, more examples and fleshing out how this would work in, sure. in, um, in actuality would be helpful as well. Thank you. Thanks for the comments, Renee. I appreciate it. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our next presenter. Thanks, Gabe. Um, so we're going to move on to our backstop um, capacity procurement. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, so as most folks are probably aware, the CAISO has the authority, authority to backstop um, for a number of scenarios, which include things like system and local annual and monthly deficiencies, local dis collective deficiencies, significant events, exceptional dispatch, et cetera. Um, and under the RAE, we've identified a few scenarios where, um, based on changes we're making, that we feel that there's a need to extend backstop authority. Um, so we move to the next slide. Um, so given the way that the um, RA paper has bifurcated between um, a draft final proposal and um, some elements that are in six and um, pending straw proposals, um, we've had to also sort of break apart the CPM section. Um, and so um, I'm going to go over kind of where each of these elements have landed. So um, first off, um, the only draft final element we have for the CPM section is um, a new CPM authority to cure a deficiency when a local or sub area fails to meet um, the energy sufficiency test. Um, so currently, CPM for local, um, we have the authority to um, cure deficiencies based on capacity. And so um, this new um, proposal um, would be asking for CPO authority for energy insufficiency. Um, and so um, Catalan um, and folks are um, in the local study process not only identifying um, capacity needs of these different areas, but also um, minimum energy requirements. And so um, the CPO authority would be um, in place to cure any energy insufficiencies we might have um, for things like charging up batteries, et cetera. Um, so this is the, again, the only um, draft final element. And so um, we're hoping to take this to the March board. Um, and so far, stakeholder comments have um, been generally supportive of this extension of authority um, to include um, energy insufficiencies in the local area. Um, and then in the sixth revised draft proposal, um, we want to kind of clarify um, the system CPM designations um, when we move to the UCAP slash NQC process. Um, so in prior iterations, we had sort of identified um, CPM authority for UCAP as a separate authority um, back when UCAP was going to be a separate term um, and then retain authority for um, our current NQC, which is DQC um, in the UCAP world. Um, and so we want to, in the sixth revise, sort of clarify um, with this incorporation of the UCAP into um, the existing NQC terminology, where NQC will now represent not only deliverability, but availability, um, that we think that rather than seeking a separate authority, that in this process we would just be updating that the requirements would now be in terms of UCAP um, and the designations would be in terms of UCAP. Um, and so explaining how 
um, that process would work. And so there's been some stakeholder comments about why do you need both UCAP and the local capacity CCM authority. Um, and so this sort of clarifies that um, CCM designations under the UCAP paradigm will only be in terms of UCAP and trying to cure UCAP deficiencies. Um, and so we won't have sort of this two um, metric CPM authority that everything for system deficiencies will be in terms of UCAP. Um, and so that is outlined in the six revised draft proposal to um, coincide with the um, UCAP proposal. And then um, the final pending element is um, we, as part of the portfolio assessment, um, there's been a desire to have CPM authority to cure any deficiencies identified through that um, analysis. And um, this portfolio analysis, um, which we outlined in um, November, um, is still a work in progress. And so this will move forward as um, that policy moves forward. Um, and so there's been remaining questions around um, in this analysis, um, how would we identify um, the backstop need and inform um, LCs on what could they could possibly procure to cure the deficiencies and not having to um, have the CAISA backstop to fill the need. Um, and so all the questions um, will be further worked out as um, we continue to stakeholder the portfolio analysis. Um, and so just want to let folks know that, um, again, for the CPM section in the draft final, we will be moving forward with um, seeking CPM authority to cure local energy um, deficiencies. And then um, we are providing clarifications around how the movement to a UCAP paradigm would affect um, CPM designations for um, system requirements. And then that the portfolio analysis um, CCM authority will um, be developed in lockstep with that proposal. Um, so if we move to the next slide. Um, so just to provide a little bit more clarity, um, and so this again is more of a six revised straw proposal element, um, but again with the transition to um, MQC representing both availability and deliverability, um, system deficiencies will be assessed and cured in terms of the new term UCAP um, NQC. Um, and so in this transition, the Kaiser is not proposing um, changes to the process that we use to assess and designate system deficiencies, um, but the RA requirements and counting methodologies will change as we transition to UCAP. Um, and so now the CAISA will make um, system CPM designations in terms of UCAP NQC once it's implemented. Again, the CAISO will not backstop if a single LLC is deficient, um, but only if there is an overall deficiency based on all of the RA showings. Um, this will apply in both the year ahead and month ahead timeframes. Um, we will continue to notify and allow entities to first cure the identified deficiency before the CAISO would make a backstop. Um, so again, more details can be found in the six revised. Um, and so if you have any questions around how um, we would now be CPMing for under the UCAP paradigm, please include those in your written comments. Um, so let's move to the next slide. So um, this is sort of outlines um, once all of the CPM authority um, is moved forward, how we would um, designate and cure deficiencies. Um, so first step would be to cure any um, system UCAP or NQC deficiencies. Um, then we would move to local individual deficiencies and then local collective deficiencies, which could be made in terms of capacity or energy. Um, and then finally, um, any deficiencies that may have been um, identified in the portfolio analysis. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Um, and then finally, we wanted to update stakeholders um, that in prior iterations, we had proposed uh, the UCAP deficiency tool, um, which would have penalized individual LSCs whose showings were below their requirements um, and paid uh, an incentive payment to any LC who um, overshowed as a tool to prevent leaning. Um, and largely, stakeholder comments did not support moving forward with this tool. Um, some of the feedback we heard was that um, being charged with CPM costs was a sufficient deterrent for um, under showing um, that 
having incentives to overshow might incentivize um, LLCs to hold on to excess capacity rather than selling it in the bilateral market, which might further distort the bilateral market. And then um, some stakeholders also pointed out that this might duplicate um, existing LRA compliance penalties and um, from a individual LLC's perspective might be um, a double penalty because they had to pay the LRA for being deficient and they would also be charged from the CAISO um, uh, UCAP deficiency pay a penalty. And so while the CAISO disagrees with some of these assertions, um, as we've talked about in prior iterations, um, we've decided to um, not move forward with the UCAP deficiency tool in this RE initiative, um, but um, once UCAP is implemented, if we identify significant meaning, um, we may revisit um, this policy in the future if it becomes a significant issue. Um, so I will pause here for any questions or feedback. We have a few questions in the queue. Caller, please go ahead. Call your lines unmuted, please go ahead. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, my question was in the last section and I've already sent it in, so you can skip me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next caller, please go ahead. Hi, this is Sergio Oñez from the California Energy Storage Alliance, uh, CSA. My, my questions were also in the previous section, so I'll reach out to Gabe uh, directly to, to save time here. Thank you. Okay, next caller in the queue, please. Hi, this is Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Can you go back to slide 59? So I was confused about this. So um, if there's a system deficiency, um, will you cure for the system deficiency first? Um, or if there's a system deficiency and there's local deficiencies, do you cure and then allocate the cost to those local individuals first? Because just this slide made it seem like you're going to do the system first and then peanut butter the cost. But I thought the proposal was to allocate it to the individual deficient entities. So just a clarification question. Uh, yeah, so I think um, your understanding is correct that first if there was um, a system deficiency, the LSEs that um, came in short um, that were contributing to this overall system deficiency would be allocated CPM costs first. Um, and then um, if those megawatts cured um, any local deficiencies, um, then that would also impact how much was designated for local. Um, so this is sort of the, um, yeah, it would trickle down so that we would first, if there was an overall system deficiency, um, we would cure that and charge the um, LSCs that came in short. Um, and then if there were any remaining um, local deficiencies, then we would um, CPM for those. And then finally, if there were um, any additional um, need to identify in the portfolio analysis, um, then that would be for the final um, cure. And then after you do the final one before the portfolio analysis, will you rerun the portfolio analysis? Um, that okay. is a no, question. we won't. No, we won't, carry. We don't have an opportunity to do that administratively. Okay. I think that makes sense, or I think I understand. Um, and then um, final question is, um, you're not, are you proposing to give up your, oh gosh, uh, the, um, whatever the new NQC, or the, the NQC as it exists today, the, the current system RA, deficiency, are you proposing to give up that authority or is this just additive to your existing authority? Um, it's not additive or letting go of it. It's sort of a mm, realignment with the existing, with the new counting system. So um, in the past when we were going to have NQC and UCAP as two terms, we proposed 
um, to retain that like old NQC um, seizure authority and then seek a new one for UCAP. Um, and so this is clarifying that because UCAP is being, being incorporated into NQC that basically we will update the portions of its tariff that identify what the requirements are and is the basis for um, identifying the deficiencies and then we would be designating in terms of UCAP NQC. So it's more of a realignment with this new counting system, um, realigning our existing tariff authority to be in this new counting realm. So we won't be having a UCAP NQC um, megawatt requirement and an additional DQC requirement where we might have two backstop authorities. Now we will, um, under this, sort of in the way that we're going to implement UCAP, we will not only have sort of one counting framework where it's all in terms of UCAP and QC. Um, does that make sense? It does, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have two more in the queue. Okay. Next caller, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Bridget. This is the White Zhou so from SC. Um, just a quick clarified question. You probably already thought about this, but it's not entirely clear to me. Um, so for the, a local individual deficiencies, um, does that cover when the CPE is in operation? And, um, and it will treat differently in the proposal? So, hey, this is Carl. In, in the instance where the CPE is in place, the CPE will be seen, at least as I, I think the, the plan for implementation of that, the CPE would be the deficient entity uh, for that local area and receive the cost allocation for that. And then... Okay, that's what I thought. The CPC jurisdiction, um, they'll have to work out how that then gets reallocated out amongst the uh, constituent LSEs. Okay, thank you. And next caller, please go ahead. Hi, um, this is Kathleen Colbert from the Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I'm maybe asking a, a, probably asking a question again, but I just wanted to make sure I understood it. I thought I heard, heard you say in your presentation that you would not be backstopping, uh, using the CPM to backstop for individual deficiencies for local LSUs in short, but then I'm looking at the slide that's up and I see that local individual deficiencies are on the list and I also kind of thought there already was that authority. Can you just re-clarify that for me, please? Yeah. So. Um, it's probably a, a little unclear because it should be local area individual deficiencies. Um, and so the idea, again, is that um, where, the, where there might be some confusion is for system, um, we're not going to be um, looking at each individual LSC and whether or not they're short or not for the system requirements. Um, only if when we add them all up, if there's still a deficiency, then we would CPM. Um, but obviously with local areas, um, we need the specific capacity in those areas. Um, and so we would sort of evaluate that as a separate process where in the local areas, if an LC was um, deficient in meeting the requirement, we would CPM, um, even if the overall system was um, fine. But again, because local areas have different needs, um, we, could, we would still want to make sure that um, if there was a the local area deficiency that that would be cured regardless of what the system is. Um, thanks, that's helpful. Um, and just following up again, so like in your current authority, you can backstop for insufficient local capacity area resources in an annual or monthly resource adequacy plan. Mm -hmm. um, it, that sounds very similar to what you're saying, unless I'm missing it. And is what you're trying to emphasize that it's that was all local? Like currently, it's all local resources, regardless of local area, local capacity resource, um, 
LCRA areas or LCRA sub areas. Is, is that what I'm not connecting with us on? Yeah, so this, in, this slide is in, intended to illustrate a change in the current practices rather than just to, to show um, with these changes how they'd be incorporated into the existing process. Um, so the way that local is done today will remain. The only thing that will change is that in addition to looking at um, capacity needs, we'll be adding in an energy requirement as well um, and making sure that, um, that all the capacity, since we're getting more and more use limited or um, limited resources, that there's also sufficient energy to fulfill the need um, for things like batteries um, that might be located um, in these areas, so there's enough energy to charge those up to meet later in the day peak. Um, so, yeah, so however we do it today, the idea is that we continue those processes, um, it would just be a matter of adding in um, not only a check for capacity, but a check for energy, um, and the processes as they exist today would continue, um, and then you know, once we tier system and local, we're going to um, have this third check of the portfolio analysis um, to also make sure that um, when we stack up the portfolio of resources, um, you know, what is the probability that we might be um, insufficient and could possibly procure additional resources um, if that, um, you know, the, the analysis showed a significant risk of um, loss of load event, et cetera. And so, again, portfolio analysis is still a work in progress. Um, and so this is to sort of illustrate, um, you know, all these tweaks, how they would line up in the process, but um, not proposing um, significant changes to the overall processes of how we see PM. Um, but and rather just a, a re... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And this is probably self-explanatory, but I just want to hear and you confirm it if you don't mind. That you're only talking about the annual or the monthly CPMs, and nothing intramonthly. Oh yeah. Other than that, there and we still have the authority to designate a significant event, um, and so that could be intramonth. Um, but again, this is the, our normal annual monthly processes um, would apply. Um, but for things like a significant event, um, we or might be an CPM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, perfect. So not any changes to the current process, just added energy. Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Do um, you have any remaining callers? We do have uh, someone else who has joined the queue. Okay. Call your lines unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, this is Peter Griffiths with PG&E, and I, I, just, I was just confused by the conversation you had and, and sort of what's on the slide now or what you have up now. Um, my understand, and as I understand what your explanation was, um, it, it basically you're saying that the processes will not change at all in terms of how the ISO is doing the looking at and determining what the deficiencies are. Is that correct? Correct. Other than adding in the energy requirement, for local areas, um, and then sort of clarifying that when we move to um, UCAP, then we will, the metric that we CPM against will be this new UCAP NQC. But the overall processes that we have in place today will not change. Okay, my, my understanding of the way the, the local, the process works for local now is that the ISO doesn't look at a local area by local area, but essentially looks at all of the local areas within a, within a TAC a transmission area at once and looks for deficiencies in, in that way before looking at sort of deficiencies in individual areas. Is, is that correct? Hi, everybody. This is Catalin. Um, so your individual responsibility, so LSE by LSE responsibility is at the TAC level, and that's where you are hold um, if, you, if you make your numbers or not. We only look at your total at the TAC level. So in order to pass, you need to have enough local resources to meet your tax level requirement. The ISO does the analysis what resources are missing. We are going all the way to the sub-area level to do technical analysis to figure it out what resources are missing and, and are required in order to meet the standards. 
Um, but that's not how LSC compliance is done. LSC compliance is done at the tech level. Okay, so so you are looking back, and just to clarify, Catalan, um, you you are looking at 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 what is coming in at, uh, in terms of the local capacity, and you're doing it down to the sub the, the sub area level, um, but and identifying deficiencies there. But in terms of uh, of, of individual LSC deficiencies, that only depends upon, to some degree, if a if a collective local deficiency has been has been identified. Um, yeah. So the first the, the first one that yeah the first the first local where it says local individual deficiency, that right. it it comes from the LSE's responsibility to meet its total tax number. So if you met your okay. tax number, you're not deficient anymore. You won't get a cost for that. You can get a cost okay. for collective, but you will not get cost for individual if you met your tax target. Now, if you did not meet your tax target, you expose yourself to individual as well as collective. The way we figure out what resources are missing, we actually do technical studies all the way to the sub-area level to make sure every reliability is met. And if it's not, then we can CPM all the way down to the sub-area level. Okay. And, and, and it's only just sort of what happens to the co to the cost allocation as to as to how that how those costs of that CPM is is determined. Correct. Okay. Thanks. We do have one more caller in the queue. Caller, please go ahead. Um, hi, it's Mary Lynch with Constellation, and I had to step away for a while, so if this has been discussed, just, just tell me and I can take it offline. But um, looking at, let me see which slide it was for you, yeah, this, this slide with the, with the down arrow, I'm not understanding what the difference is between a collective deficiency and the portfolio analysis deficiency. Is it just that what you're calling local collective deficiencies is only going to apply with respect to local capacity and the portfolio analysis of systems? Or... That, that, that's mm -hmm. right, Mary. This is Carl. Yeah. Um, the, the, the portfolio analysis is not going to get into uh, all the nitty-gritties of, of the power flow analyses that the local will. So we'll still have both those studies independently. So we'll do the local study and uh, the portfolio will be a system-based study. Okay, thank you. Okay, we actually do have one more caller in the queue. Caller, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, this is Kathleen Culver from Victor again. Um, sorry, the back and forth had made me think of another and this um, question about this, so um, thanks to PG&E. Uh, since I heard Catalan speak, I think my question is more for Catalan, which is why I didn't ask it the first time around. But I just wanted to con I wanted to ask if the energy requirement that you're talking about, the energy assessment that's being added as a part of this change, is implementing that the review to see if there are sufficient local resources, um, given the charging limitations that we've been talking about more in the local capacity um, requirement stakeholder meetings that we've been holding for Catalan, you've been going through um, your charts about the, the max amount of storage, both on a total basis and a four-hour basis. And um, my understanding on that was that there uh, wasn't enough local resources that the CPM would be the, the tool used to solve that um, reliability issue you identified. It, is when you say, when, when the guys are saying energy, is that what you're talking about, that process, or is it something in addition to that? Yes. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, today we're only okay, looking you. at the, the peak hour and we want to make sure that we have enough resources to meet all the hours of the day because it's, at some point in time we'll have to charge the batteries, the sun is done at some point in time, so we want to make sure that we can meet the reliability standards all hours of the day rather than just the peak hour of the day. Okay, thank you so much for clarifying and connecting the dots between these initiatives. I, it just happened in my head, so thank, thank you all so much. Okay, no more callers in the queue. Okay, um, so let's move on to the next section. Um, and I know we're getting short on time, so I'm at least gonna present it. And then if um, we don't get through Q&A, we can um, include this a little bit in um, next week's call. 
Um, so this piece is um, something new um, that's in the six revised. Um, and so with the sunsetting of RAIN, um, RMR resources have been transitioned um, in prior um, initiatives that RMR resources are now under RAIN as the main tool to ensure their availability. Um, and as with the implementation of UCAP, we're proposing to get rid of RAIN. Um, there creates this need for a new availability um, penalty um, mechanism for RMR resources to ensure that they are um, fulfilling their obligations. Um, so again, with the removal of RAIN, um, this will also remove the current incentive mechanism in place for RMR resources, which currently um, holds them to a 96.5% monthly availability target with a plus or minus two dead ban um, for determining incentive or penalty payments. Um, and in RAE, we're proposing a new penalty structure um, to help ensure um, RMR's availability. And while we only have a handful of RMR resources today, um, there is the potential that this could increase in the future as more of the fleet nears retirement and as we are, we are um, transitioning to um, renewable plus storage, um, there may be the need to keep some of these resources online to better facilitate that transition. Um, so if we move to the next slide. Um, so the KISO and prior iterations had just sort of pointed out a few things we might consider in a new penalty structure. Um, and so as we're nearing the end stages of this initiative, um, we wanted to put um, meat on the bones of proposal. Um, so we are now proposing this new RMR availability penalty structure, um, which will now assess RMR resources on a 24 by seven basis with a monthly availability target of 94.5%, um, which is similar to the um, sort of bottom of the dead band of um, the current R uh, RAIN target. Um, and so availability will, will be measured um, through bids submitted um, to the day ahead market. Um, and the assumption that's being made is that the resource will bid um, if it's not on an outage. And so if it's not bidding, then that represents an outage. Um, and so if the RMR resource bids less than 94.5% of hours for that month, it will be assessed a penalty based on the RMR monthly fixed cost. Um, and so any penalties that are assessed against the resource will be returned to entities responsible for paying the RMR contract. Um, and if the resource bids above this 94.5% target, there'll be no penalty assessed. Um, so currently under RAIM, they are eligible for an incentive payment um, but because RMR resources um, get their full cost of service, um, the CAISO believes that it would be um, unfair to give them an incentive payment. And so this new structure is strictly a penalty payment um, to ensure that the resources are bidding into the market and fulfilling their obligation. Next slide. Um, and so the, well, the CAISO believes that the standardized availability target will be appropriate for most resources. Um, we do recognize that RMRs are unique resources near the end of their life. Um, and so we are also considering modifications to the pro forma RMR agreement um, to provide a little bit of a um, stopgap measure if the standardized target does not work for this resource. Um, so specifically, we would be looking at updating the RMR Article 7 and Schedule L request and approval process to reimburse the resource if they need to take a longer maintenance outage um, to keep the resource operational outside of this 94.5% availability target. Um, so again, this would be plan maintenance um, worked out ahead of time. Um, and since we aren't looking at outage data, only bid data, this is a way to um, prevent the resource from being assessed a penalty for an approved longer-term maintenance. Um, these provisions would allow the resource to true up costs of not meeting the um, availability penalty um, structure target by adjusting the RMR daily fixed costs moving forward to ensure that the resource can recover um, any lost daily fixed costs revenues while the unit was on a major maintenance um, outage. So if we move to the next slide. Okay, so that was the last one. Um, 
So I know we're getting close to four, but maybe we can take one or two questions um, before we end. Um, there is one caller in the queue at the moment. Caller, please go ahead. Yeah, this is Peter Griffiths with PG&E. Uh, I guess my question has to do with um, aren't, aren't RMR resources uh, treated like RA resources in the market? Um, can you maybe elaborate more of what you mean by treated RA? Well, well, they are. They're, well, I got to say, they certainly count for RA when when there are adjustments to resource adequacy. I guess my question has to do with the fact that a resource adequacy a resource, if it is in the if it does not provide a bid into the market, there is bid insertion. So, uh, is there bid insertion for RMR resources? Um, I believe we do not have bid insertion. Um, for our well, hey, Peter. Hey, Peter. This is Gabe Bertal here. Okay. Um, so we, yeah, we, yeah, um, Bridget's right. We don't have bid insertion for RMR resources, but, you know, the, the RMR resources do have a 24 by 7 must offer obligation, so they still have to put their bids into the market. And, you know, as you know, uh, they're required to bid at their marginal cost. So, so currently, so currently, there's not a check on whether or not they're actually there. Other, other than, other than the RAM. Correct. I, you know, we, you know, there, there is. Obviously, we could, um, you know, have a FERC referral if we found that RMR resources were consistently not bidding in the market. But essentially, if we're detecting any periods when the resource isn't bidding full capacity in the market and there's no outage card, that would be an interval when they wouldn't an RMR resource wouldn't be compliant with the tariffs today. Yeah, but there isn't there isn't a built-in penalty. I mean, before you had made this change to treat it to treat it under the RAM, there the the penalty was essentially there was no payment for 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 that time at which the resource was not available. Correct. Okay, I guess I guess I'm just wondering what um, uh, you know whether or not that that option is being considered um, going back to to once the once the rain goes away. So the idea of the RMR penalty structure is to automate that. So in the past, it was more of a manual process, and so um, this would be. Um, an automated process, and if they fell below that 94.5, um, as you said, they wouldn't be paid for those days. They were presumed on outage. Um, and so it's trying to achieve the same thing um, as the legacy contracts, but in a automated way. Well, I, I, I think the proposal, as, as, you've, laid, as you've laid it out, is, is quite a bit more um, more beneficial to the RMR resource um, than than the original. But um, uh, I'd rather than rather than prolong this, um, we'll we'll put some something into our comments on this. Great, thank you. And if you have any questions as you're developing those, feel free to reach out to us. Okay. At this time, we have no more callers in the queue. Okay, um, well, then I'll hand it back to Isabella. Thank you. Thanks, Bridget. So to wrap up, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, we have scheduled uh, an additional call for next Friday um, where we'll cover the minimum system RA requirement and must offer obligations topic. Um, so that call will be next Friday uh, the 15th from 10 a.m. to noon. And we do have a uh, marketing notice going out tomorrow uh, confirming that call. And um, the web conference details will be included in that notice. Um, but as far as comments go, um, we will be taking comments on the elements that we discussed these past three days um, on the 21st. And the comments template is available out on the initiative webpage. So uh, you can feel free to um, use that to submit your comments, and then we will post a separate comments template out there um, for the comments that will be due on the 29th. 
And then the um, final proposal for phase one and the draft final proposal for phase two, we're targeting to put out in February, and then we'll also hold a stakeholder call on that and accept written comments, and then we will present the proposal on the phase one elements to the board in March, and then um, the phase two A elements to the board in May, and then the phase two B elements to the board in September. So again, you can submit your comments on the draft final proposal and six revised draft proposal elements that we discussed these past three days um, by January 21st, and then um, we'll take the comments on the remaining elements that we will discuss during the January 15th call on the 29th. So with that, um, that concludes today's call, and thank you all for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining today's call. The call is ended and you may disconnect.